Good morning, everyone. We'll get started. Welcome to day two. Uh, I just have a few announcements before we get started uh, with the program today. Uh, first, there are uh, a couple of changes in workshop locations listed on this slide. So uh, Trip Gulick and Arthur Kim's uh, workshops have changed. The Regency Ballroom West is on this level, I believe and uh, PCOS is on the level above, so please take a note of that. The uh, webcasts uh, from yesterday are now live on the ISUSA website. Uh, the link is here. And uh, a reminder also about the evaluations, uh, which are also available uh, on the ISUSA website at the conference webpage. If you go and click on that, I believe on the front page there are links to the evaluations, which you can actually do in real time if you'd like after each presentation uh, or at the end of the day. So we'd appreciate if you can complete those evaluations from yesterday if you haven't done so already. Just wanted to say a, a few words about the uh, AIDS Education and Training Center programs. I think most people in the room are familiar with them, hopefully uh, have gotten training or involved in some way, perhaps tra as trainers, uh, for the various uh, sites that are here. So no matter where you live across the country or in the various uh, territories, uh, there is an AIDS Education Training Center program. You can see some of them have quite uh, large geographic areas. Uh, I'm based at the Northeast Caribbean AETC, and we do uh, all sorts of levels of training, uh, mini residencies, preceptorships, clinical consultations, uh, more traditional didactics, uh, et cetera. So really a great resource for training. If you have new staff members in your clinical settings, 
um, feel free to contact your uh, regional AETC and uh, there are undoubtedly opportunities for them to get some training. There are also uh, a number of resources through the uh, National Clinician Consultation Center that are listed on this slide. So there are um, warm lines or hot lines to handle questions that you might have in various areas uh, related to HIV management. So there's an HIV AIDS warm line, a hepatitis C warm line, a substance use warm line, perinatal HIV hotline. Um, a PrEP line and a PEP line. And uh, these are incredibly uh, useful resources if you have questions uh, related to HIV management uh, or, or prevention, hepatitis C, uh, et cetera. The hepatitis C uh, consultation services provided by the uh, National Clinical Consultation Center, uh, just to elaborate on a little bit, uh, there are a number of different topics uh, that uh, can be addressed that are listed on this slide, and uh, it's a, a nine through five service, Monday through Friday, run by UCSF. Uh, actually, I also wanted to mention uh, the National HIV Curriculum, uh, developed under the leadership of uh, uh, David Spock and John Nelson. There's a table uh, to the left when you exit uh, the ballroom where uh, there's information and there's flyers and posters about it. It's really an amazing uh, resource that I think can be useful for both uh, novices and experts in HIV care, various levels of training, CME uh, credits available. So I would encourage you, uh, there's a workshop I think later this afternoon, uh, so please, uh, if you haven't looked at this, uh, take a look and uh, take some flyers, bring them back to your clinical settings. Uh, just a reminder for the poll everywhere, if you're having any uh, issues with this, please contact an uh, IAS USA staff member. Uh, there uh, apparently are some, uh, well so just as a reminder to walk you through this, uh, you, uh, text uh, IES USA 334 to the number 22333. So if you're kind of a Luddite like me, you type the 22333 here and text uh, you know, down here, put in the IES uh, uh, USA 334. If you have a smartphone, apparently there are phones that won't accept like a five digit number. If that's the case, there's also um, Let's see back here. You can also go to uh, this uh, website uh, either from your smartphone or if you have a, a laptop or a um, uh, iPad, etc. So we're going to uh, get started with just a few. Uh, if I can advance, if we can maybe get to the ARS questions, please. Okay, great. So just, uh, we're gonna have a few warm up questions before we get into the formal program. Uh, so how many Ryan White HIV AIDS program clinical conferences have you attended? This is your first one to four, five to nine, more than 10, or I've attended them all. So just text the number of the response that you want, uh, thanks, to the, um, you know, uh, that number that you hopefully now have on your phone. So please go ahead and vote. Okay, so great, actually the uh, plurality, uh, it's your first Ryan White uh, clinical conference, and we have some veterans in the room, 14% having been at more than 10. 1% attended all of them. Okay, it's probably Laura Cheever, but. Um, <laughs> moving on, how would you classify your work setting? Urban, suburban, or rural? Okay, so two thirds in urban settings and then the rest suburban or rural. And I think this is our last question. How many hepatitis C infected patients are presently under your direct care? So you yourself are taking care of them. None, one to four, five to 10, 11 to 15, et cetera. Let's 
Uh, I was going to bring up Mike Sag to sing, but here goes the music. Okay, so really a whole range of um, numbers here, but 85% have some people with hepatitis C uh, under their care. So we'll be hearing more about hepatitis C management from Arthur Kim this afternoon. Uh, just a couple of other reminders uh, for questions in, uh, that you have. There'll be cards circulating, and it'd be great if you can come to the microphone, introduce yourself, uh, and ask your question so the people viewing the webcast can hear. And for the people who are watching via the live webcast, please email your questions to the uh, email address shown on the slide. And uh, lastly, you know, we're at near capacity here, so it would be great if people could maybe uh, not put bags, et cetera, on the uh, empty seats next to them. And if you have an empty seat, uh, I don't know if there's anyone standing at this point, but uh, if you could raise your hand if there's an empty seat next to you. Okay, good, so there actually are plenty of seats available. There's seats near the front as well. So um, thank you very much for that. And again, just a reminder, if you need to take a phone call uh, or need to chat, please uh, exit the room uh, and put your uh, phones, et cetera, on, on vibrate. So we're uh, going to get started now. And uh, it's really a pleasure for me to introduce our uh, first speaker, uh, Tom Giordano, uh, who's an associate professor uh, at Baylor and is the medical director of um, one of the top two uh, HIV clinics in terms of size in this country, the Thomas Street Clinic, and uh, with close to 6,000 patients. So uh, really uh, extraordinary clinical uh, expertise and, and leadership of a huge clinic, and, and also really one of the leading investigators in the area of adherence and uh, the uh, continuum of care and really interventions to uh, help us with uh, engaging our patients and linking them to care, and keeping them in care. And he's really going to address one of the critical gaps in this whole continuum, strategies for linkage to and engagement with care, particularly focusing on intervention. So Dr. Giordano. Thank you, Marshall, uh, for that introduction. And thank you to Laura and Mike for inviting me to speak. Good morning, everyone. So um, I'm going to jump right in if I can figure this out. Uh, I have no conflicts of interest to uh, report. And these are our goals, which uh, are to discuss interventions to improve linkage to care, discuss interventions to improve retention and care. And then I, I do want to touch on something that um, a lot of people are talking about across the country, which is rapid treatment protocols, because I think it's important to understand the data supporting that. Uh, so this is the, the care continuum. I like the care continuum a little better than the care cascade because the care continuum, and this is a, a figure that Laura um, published 10 years ago, um, talks, acknowledges that people can move back and forth in, in care. Uh, so on the very far left side of the care continuum is someone who's unaware of their HIV status, and then um, they can be tested, found to be positive, and linked to care, get into care, and then fully engage in care. And, and our marker for that is they attend their visits and their viral load is undetectable. But this is nice because it recognizes that it's not a permanent state. Once you're undetectable, things happen. You can shift. You can lose insurance. You can relapse in substance use. And you can shift back and forth. And so the idea that the goal is to keep people as fully engaged as possible so that their clinical uh, outcomes are optimized. And that's an ongoing um, interface with the healthcare system. It's not once you achieve it, you're there forever. We know that. So that is a, a schematic that helps us think about what we're trying to achieve. Now, we know this is important to try to get as many people in care and keep them in care for forever, right? And get them undetectable and keep them that way forever. There's two landmark studies that I'm sure everyone in this room is familiar with. There's the, the START study that showed that uh, it's important to treat everyone with HIV as soon as you're diagnosed because there is no safe CD4 that you can uh, avoid treatment with or defer treatment with. So randomized trial, if you're uh, people with a CD4 greater than 500, and people who got immediate therapy did better clinically with hard outcomes than people who deferred therapy. So it's important to treat everyone 
one as soon as they're diagnosed, as, as soon as possible. And then we know that continuous treatment is better than inter interrupted treatment, and that was the START study from about 10 years before, I'm sorry, the SMART study from about 10 years before, that showed that uh, there is no safe CD4 at which you can sort of uh, 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 cruise uh, without treatment. So once you start people on therapy, uh, you need to keep them on therapy forever. So, and, and that is important for their clinical outcomes. So that's pretty straightforward. It's also important to recognize that there's a huge public health benefit to getting people in care, keeping them in care, and getting them undetectable, and keeping them undetectable. And that's rec um, two, two big studies, I think, that, that demonstrate that. On the right side of the slide, you see results from the HPTN 052 study that showed that um, there basically aren't transmissions to, of HIV to an uninfected partner when someone is on ART and has virologic suppression. And there's other data to support that statement. Um, and then on the left, you can see uh, the impact of, of retention in care and linkage in care on HIV transmissions. So CDC modeled um, the number of people at each stage in the continuum, undiagnosed, aware, but not in care, uh, in care, but not on ART, and then virally suppressed. They, they took that, they estimated the number of people in each of those categories in the U.S. They got what they could about what they think the viral load of those people would be, and then they, they figured out what the risk behaviors, the, the behaviors of forward transmission of the average person in that category would be as well. Put all that into a model, churned it out, and came up with these estimates on the left side of the slide that show that the unaware um, probably contribute about 30% to forward transmissions in the U.S., but the aware but not in care contribute more than half of the um, forward transmissions of HIV in the U.S. So getting people in care and keeping them there so they can become undetectable is probably the most important public health intervention out there for HIV prevention. It's not easy, but it, it really is an important goal. So when, when I give this talk uh, or when I talk to some more seasoned clinicians or some people who are um, uh, a little more jaded, they sometimes um, uh, say, you know, God, well, I don't get it. There's all these people with HIV out there. We have great treatments. If they, you know, they just need to make use of them. It's a fatal disease, but with treatment, it's, 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 it, you can live a long time. And I told them this, and, you know, and they just, they never show up. And they, then they throw their hands up and they say, you know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. And so this is the preachy part of the talk, I will admit it, but you have to put yourself in the horse's perspective, right? What if the horse isn't thirsty right now? What if the last time the horse drank water, it made him sick or it just tasted horrible? What if the horse just spent three nights in the rain and mud because he has no barn and water just isn't what he's looking for right now? What if someone, well-meaning, gave him a little kick in the butt to try to get him to go to that trough to drink, and the horse didn't like that kick? What if the trough was 30 miles away? What if the water just plain old cost too much for him to afford? Even if you think it's really cheap, it, in his perspective, it's unaffordable. I mean, this is simple, right? But it helps think, put, the, put this into context um, so we can avoid being the jaded, burned out clinician. So, linkage to care. It's a pretty simple definition of, of what linkage is. Ideally, it's a complete visit with a person who can manage HIV, not the nurse intake, but a person who can prescribe ART and manage, H manage HIV. Whether they're gonna be their provider forever or not is not the question, but just someone who can prescribe ART. And the goal is to have that happen within 30 days of diagnosis. Um, the, uh, it's really important to monitor linkage. Um, and it, it, one of the, the hard things about linkage is there's two people involved. There's three people involved, right? So there's the patient, but there's two, there's the diagnosing site and then there's the treating site. And if they're the same, this is not so hard. Um, and you can walk the patient from the diagnosing site uh, across the hall to the treating site. That makes it a lot easier, right? And, and that's, that's cool. But what if the testing site is, is 10 miles from the treatment site, or you know, they don't offer a treatment in their clinic. And so who's responsible for that person's linkage? The testing site really should try to maintain enough contact with that patient to know that their patient linked. And the treating site needs to try to capture people in their denominator 
as soon as they're aware of a person um, um, who is newly diagnosed and seeking services. Um, and that our EMRs are not honestly set up to do that, right? Because someone walks in and says, I'd like to get a visit scheduled, and the first thing they have to do is go through eligibility and all this other stuff, and that doesn't necessarily show up in the EMR. So trying to understand your denominator can be challenging. Um, so, but you want to, or they call and say, can I get an appointment? There may be very limited record of that, but that person should enter your denominator for is this person successfully linked once they touch our clinic. So think about that if you're one of the clinic leadership or uh, leadership approaches you, how you can really make sure your denominator is appropriate. And then of course, it goes without saying, um, uh, based on the horse <laughs> analogy, that it, you really have to be persistent, but also very sensitive to, to what's going on in the patient's world right now. Um, I mean, they just got diagnosed with HIV. That's not an easy uh, pill to swallow, no pun intended. Um, and, um, and so it's, it takes time and it takes sensitivity and understanding to deliver linkage services. There's a lot of influences from the literature and opportunities to improve linkage. Um, there are some demographic features that have been associated with uh, harder time linking to care. Uh, younger age, um, the people who, are, who practice in adolescent clinic, clinics know this. Um, African American uh, race ethnicity has been associated with hard, harder time linking. Uh, injection drug use as a risk factor. Um, Disease severity kind of is maybe a little bit opposite what you'd think. The sicker someone is, the more readily they link, probably because they, they get it, they're sick, and they, then they've experienced um, the risk of HIV and want to uh, partake of the benefit. So the, the sicker you are, the easier it is to link, generally. Um, socioeconomic resources obviously play a role. Uh, opportunity costs, meaning um, that if someone has to miss work and is in a job where they don't have paid time off, then, then that's, a, that's a barrier. And then unmet needs, food, housing, money, transportation things. These things are higher priority than getting medical care in most people's minds. And so if they can't, if they can't feed themselves or their family, then attending a visit with you may not be the highest on their list. Um, and then finally, active substance use, mental health problems, um, very strong linkages to uh, delayed linkage to care. And stigma, um, especially in that right after there's someone's diagnosed, they may have internalized stigma about HIV, they may have stigma about um, their uh, sexual risk uh, that gave them HIV, there may be a lot of guilt around it. Um, and then they, there's all the co-occurring conditions like homelessness and mental health problems that have their own stigma, and so uh, this can be a big, big barrier. There's also things, and, and part of the theme of, of today's talk is, okay, there's all these patient factors that are out there, but let's not ignore ourselves. What are we doing that, can, that helps or hinders linkage and retention and care? So as I mentioned, co-location of testing and treatment services is something that makes it easier for our patients, uh, that warm handoff of walking someone across the hall or across the street to the treatment site. So if you have some influence about where you're gonna offer treatment and testing, keep that in mind. Um, active linkage services versus passive linkage services, and I'll, I'll explain that a little bit in the next slide in more detail, but the idea that you're actually helping the person link to services rather than just handing them a list of, uh, a piece of paper with a list of clinics and phone numbers on it and say, go, uh, find yourself a doctor. Um, uh, Copays and insurance status are barriers, and so we have Ryan White that helps a ton in these issues, but there's, a, you know, there are, um, there are uh, insurance issues that, that patients struggle with. Um, and then more rapid access to seeking care, uh, or more rapid access to care. Um, we'll talk about the rapid treatment protocols that, that UCSF and others have done um, later in the talk, but even that uh, issue aside, um, if you call a, a clinic and are told, okay, come on in, and then we'll, we'll get you, your, next, uh, your doctor's appointment is now six weeks from now, um, that is, people have higher no-show rates for the, in that situation than if they're told their doctor's appointment is in a week or two. So um, the more access you can um, evaluate, uh, make uh, available for your patients um, sooner, the more likely they are to attend those appointments. This is the only randomized trial that has studied an intervention to improve linkage. It's called the ARTIS intervention. Um, it was uh, published in 2005, so it's well over a decade old. Um, and Lit Gardner at the CDC was the lead investigator on this. Um, it, um, it worked, and you can see the red, red bars are better, than, higher than the blue bars. It was statistically significant, it was clinically meaningful. Um, 
and uh, it imp so it improved linkage and uh, retention uh, in, at 12 months. So the intervention was 90 days of strengths-based case management for mostly people diagnosed within the last six months. Uh, strengths-based case management is the phrase, but I have to say these were not case managers who delivered this. These were what we would call now patient navigators, though that term was not as well known at that point. So they're, they're patient navigators, they're not licensed providers, and they were trained to do this intervention. The intervention lasted 90 days or five sessions, whichever came first, and it really, helped the patient, the, the, the navigator helped the patient identify what strengths they had in their life, um, and what strong, what were they good at? And then what were their goals around HIV treatment and getting to care was sort of, they worked to make that one of their goals. And then they identified ways that they could use their strengths to achieve that goal. Um, and it was all patient directed. It was meeting the patient where they were and then using, letting the patient dictate the plan they were gonna take with guidance from the navigator. So um, it, uh, it shares a lot with motivational interviewing or with um, acceptance commitment therapy. There's some common elements there. And it worked, and then it was replicated in non-academic uh, community settings. So it is the standard of care. It should be standard of care. A lot of public health um, um, organizations, like the cities uh, or the counties that run the public health um, uh, health departments, they train their DIS in artists, and everyone really should be trained in artists if they're going to be responsible for linkage to care. So, so that is the only uh, randomized uh, uh, intervention proven in a randomized trial for linkage to care. So I'm going to switch to retention and care. Um, retention and care is a little more complicated in terms of definitions um, because it's not just one visit. It's retention is a, over time, and so you want to show consistent engagement with a patient over time. Um, there, are, there are constancy measures, which is did this person attend at least a number of visits, a minimum number of visits over a certain time period? Um, so the HRSA definition, one of them is two visits in a year, at least 90 days apart, to so, so show some persistent engagement with care. Um, that doesn't take into account missed visits and so and, and how sick the patient might be and how many visits they might need. And so there's this other category of retention measures called adherence uh, measures that, are, that um, could be just a count of the number of missed visits or the proportion of visits that were scheduled that were indeed attended or missed. Um, it turns out both of these are really important measures. They're independent predictors of mortality in studies. So there's not, one is not better than the other. They're, they're both good, and if you can do both, do both. Um, but they do require an observation period to, to measure. And so there's one nice clinically relevant uh, measure of retention, which is when's the last time you saw the patient? So you, you look at your schedule, and if it's been a long time, and you know your patients, it's been a long time since you saw them, and you know their viral load is, is not undetectable, um, that person is not engaged in care, right? They're not retained in care. So um, that's a nice clinically relevant uh, metric. So, and it's really important to measure retention. It's a, it's a performance indicator. Um, uh, but it's really especially important for people who are newer to care and whose viral load is um, detectable. And just like linkage, you've got to be persistent and you've got to understand where your patients are coming from for retention. This is uh, the, the same slide as for linkage, the other influences and opportunities. Um, very similar risk factors. The, the differences or the new uh, content is in red, so you don't have to bother rereading the black part. Um, recent incarceration is a, is a major barrier for retention and care. Um, and then because you now you're talking about someone who has been to the clinic, their experiences with the clinic matter, with the provider and with the clinic staff. So the patient-provider relationship, trust in the provider, and then their overall clinic experience, that patient satisfaction stuff. Actually, there's data to support that that does matter, and we'll review, review that in a second. Um, and, so, and then, of course, we want to offer patients as many opportunities as possible to come to clinic and stay persistently engaged in care. And so flexible appointments, evening hours, Saturday hours, those things help. They're, they're not easy to, to do, um, but they do help. Um, copay, financial insurance assistance, um, and Ryan White makes a huge difference here, too. But you know, something to help the patient have uninterrupted access to care. There's only, in terms of interventions that have been proven in, in randomized trials, again, there's really only one that's been proven uh, that would be appropriate for the routine clinical context in the US. 
There's other literature out there, but this is, you know, if I think about this audience, this, is, this would be the intervention. It was also led by Lit Gardner uh, at CDC, um, and it was tested in six clinics, and there are people, uh, some people in the room here who were part of that uh, group of studies as well. It's called the Retention Through Enhanced Personal Contact, or REPC intervention. Um, they, um, it was a three-arm study. There was a usual care arm and two intervention arms. Now, the two intervention arms, one was sort of moderate intensity and one was more intense. Uh, the higher intensity arm did the same as the moderate intensity arm. So I'm going to describe the moderate intensity arm because that's the one that worked. Um, and adding the extra stuff didn't add an, any extra benefit. So in the moderate intensity arm, people, once they agreed to enter the study, and they were recruited at the clinic, so they had to come to the clinic, but they had a past history of poor retention. The, uh, they were recruited and they got an HIV 101 session, sort of 20 minutes long. Here's HIV, here's why it's important to get in care, here's why it's important to attend your visits and take your medicines. Now, this was delivered by a patient navigator. They were called a retention specialist, but an unlicensed person. So it's something a lot of clinics could probably afford to do. Um, and then they got an, uh, uh, they were, you know, they had a visit scheduled. It might have been three months later with their doc. And so they had an interim phone call at the, to the midpoint between today and when that three-month visit was supposed to be. So six weeks later, they would just get a check-in from the retention specialist over the phone. Hey, how you doing? Anything going on? You need any help? You got that appointment coming up. Um, can I help you in any way? Make sure you attend it. And then seven days and two days before the, the visit, they got the same thing. Um, a brief phone call reminder. And then when the patient did attend the visit, they had a face-to-face -face handshake. Hey, how you doing? Great to see you. So glad you're here. Is there anything you need? Can I link you to any services? They didn't provide services for substance use or transportation assistance, but they linked to available services. If the patient missed the visit, then they immediately reached out to the patient to try to reschedule, figure out what the barriers were, and help link the, to those services. They did this intervention for a year. It sounds fairly intense, but it actually wasn't too much work. We had two, uh, ret two retention coordinators in our clinic for over 200 patients. Uh, and they intervened for over a year. So it's not an undoable intervention for routine care. And at the bottom, you can see the uh, results. Um, you can see all the enhanced contact arm and the enhanced contact plus skills arms were exactly the same. Um, but it was a 10% bump in the visit constancy measure compared to usual care and about a 3 to 5% bump in the visit adherence measure. And this was probably clinically meaningful. Um, and as I said, it is the uh, uh, only intervention proven in a randomized trial that would be really appropriate for the routine care setting. Um, it did work also in some really important subsets. I know this is not legible, so read the red text. Um, it worked in people with detectable viral loads. It worked in people with low CD4, people who were youth, minority, race, ethnicity, public insurance, or no insurance. It did not work in people who were active substance users, and it did not work in people who had a lot of unmet needs. Um, the unmet needs measured here were just very severe unmet needs, food, housing. Um, so, um, so, you know, it's not a cure-all, but it is, uh, it is something that we should try to offer. And the good news is CDC has recognized this and is now packaging this intervention for dissemination and training like they do for artists. It's not ready yet, but I expect that in the next year or two, you'll be able to sign up for free training on the REPC intervention. So keep an eye out for that. Um, other, other interventions that are more for niche audiences, uh, in-clinic opioid replacement therapy for opioid users, um, using the EMR, now this, was, this study was done pre-EPIC, which seems to be the market leader now. Um, so how, but you think about, can you, can you build some triggers in EPIC to alert you when there's a person with a detectable viral load who hasn't been seen in a while? Um, uh, Non-randomized studies support clinic-wide marketing. Uh, we did some of that as part of the REPC study uh, before the randomized trial. Brochures, um, posters saying, please keep your doctor's appointments. It's great. We, you know, together we can make a difference. Um, customer service training uh, to let make sure all the frontline staff are happy to see people and not punishing people who show up and saying, why weren't you here last time? Um, that punitive approach doesn't work. It's much more constructive to, to be um, um, positive when someone comes in and provide a welcoming experience. Um, and then step case management, social work, outreach services, all these things have, have some evidence behind them. Some of them are very intensive. There's mixed data for navigators. Um, 
th they certainly have a role in the clinic, but they're not going to, again, be the cure-all for everyone. Treatment supporters, peers um, ha certainly have a role, too, because no one has the power to tell someone what it's like to live with HIV except someone who, who has it and has been there. But again, they're not going to be the cure-all. And then financial incentives um, is something that's kind of in the literature right now. Um, how you make that sustainable is a, is a huge question. Data to care is something that everyone should have heard of, or, or if, you, if you're not, um, you should be aware of it. Um, it's an idea that um, the public health authority, whether it's your city health department in your county or your state, has all this information that the clinic doesn't have. They get all our viral loads in CD4, right? That's great. But they also know who's dead, who's alive, who's moved out of region. They have all kinds of contact information that you don't have. They know who's in jail, who's in prison. All this stuff, they have all these databases they can search and figure out who's not in care really versus who's moved on. Um, Either, either actually or metaphysically. Um, so data to care is something that CDC is very much in support of and a lot of jurisdictions are trying. These are data from New York City um, that showed that uh, out of about 800 people that they thought were lost, um, the public health authority investigated and found, you know, some of them were actually moved on or, or transferred elsewhere or died. Um, they found a few hundred that needed, uh, about 400 that needed services, and they were able to get a couple hundred back into services. So in pretty nice yield. It's, it's not something that's going to, again, you're not going to get a 90% yield here. You're going to get a 20, 40% yield. But it, it made a difference. Um, Seattle, when they did it, they had much lower success rates, and not, not because they failed to get people engaged, but because so many of their people had actually moved out of the region. Um, so there is some regional variation. In North Carolina, they did it all by telephone and found really nice results. Um, so there's, there's mixed data on this approach, um, and part of it probably is dependent on the quality of the data that the public health authority has available to them, the timeliness of that data, how quickly they can turn it into actionable data, the population characteristics, and the model you're using. So um, it's out there, and we should all be supporting these efforts, um, and, and it can certainly play a role in improving retention. These are more data on patient satisfaction. This is um, from uh, Bic Deng, who's one of uh, the faculty in my group. Um, she uh, waited till people had attended their first clinician visit as new patients in our clinic, and then just did a patient satisfaction questionnaire, the standard <coughs> CMS kind of approach. Um, you know, how satisfied were you with your provider, the cleanliness of the clinic, all those things that the administrators are shoving down our throats that we think are junk, right? And then she said, okay, what's their likelihood of attending the next visit in the next six months? And it turns out it was a predictor of whether people attended. Not anything about the quality of the care. Did they prescribe the right ARV? That's important, but patients don't know that. This is just how much do you like your provider? How satisfied were you with the visit? And it did predict retention. That is entirely in our control. You know, we're not trying to treat someone's depression here. We're trying to make ourselves better communicators, more effective communicators, better customer uh, service. So that's something that I think is a very powerful opportunity. Um, being constructive in affirming attendance rather than criticizing it and collaborative, collaboratively problem solving with our patients when we identify barriers to retention. So in the few minutes left, I do want to run through some of this rapid treatment um, uh, data. Um, the idea here, oh, here's our first audience response question. Um, so among those who are uh, in clinical context, which should be everyone, about how long do you think it takes an average patient, now I know this is average, right, without private insurance to go from initiating contact with your clinical site to having ART in hand? A day, two weeks, a month, two months, four months, or I have no idea. So from the time they make contact to having ART. Couple weeks, a month. 
Um, so very few uh, seem to be involved in clinical care where they're doing rapid treatment, uh, but 10 percent is more than I thought it would be. Um, and so somewhere between two weeks and, and two months seems to be the average. And I think that that is pretty typical. Um, if we think about what's got to happen from a patient's perspective here, we think about it as you're tested, you go to care, you're done. From a patient's perspective, they got to test positive, get to care, and start ART. But there's a lot of intermediate steps there. First, we got to confirm the HIV diagnosis. So they got to test positive, but then we got to make sure it's really a true positive. Um, then they got to get to a treatment site. That could be easy or that could be very difficult. Then they, there's always that wallet biopsy, right? Someone's got to pay for this stuff. And so there's the financial eligibility that could include, oh, you know, we need your last six pay stubs and we need a letter of support from someone if you're homeless or you don't have any resources, all that. And that could take weeks for the patients to get all that together. It could be easy, it could be difficult. Um, and then there's the pre-care, right? There's, okay, let's draw your blood so we have, a, so your, your clinician has their genotype and their HLA status all ready to go when you see them. And so that could take a couple weeks for those results to come back, the CD4 viral load, et cetera. And then there's the counseling. And then you see the clinician who maybe prescribes ART on their first visit. I think most people are doing that. Um, but then they gotta get the ART. And Texas, three months ago, had a two-month wait for ADAP applications to be approved. They got it down to two weeks now, so that's great, but it still takes a couple weeks, and so I'm, I'm sure there are other uh, ADAPs that have similar situations, um, so that just because you write the script doesn't mean the patient has the medicine in hand. And so this could take a couple months, and it sounds like in a lot of your places it is taking a couple months, um, and the question is, um, should we try for zero? So another ARS question here. This is long, but it's a simple concept. You've just been, you're in a place that does rapid treatment. They do the same day treatment, okay? That's not, the, that's not an issue. 31 year old guy, it's signed to see you a day after his HIV diagnosis was confirmed. So we know he's got HIV. Everything else is pending. His viral load, CD4, uh, hepatitis panel, um, genotype, HLA, all done, all ordered, all drawn, but all pending and won't be back for, you know how long these tests take, three to five days, two weeks for some, and he feels fine. He's completed all the steps to be prescribed ART. He wants to start it. Um, he can pick it up from the pharmacy today if you prescribe it. So the, the question gets to how comfortable are you prescribing ART for someone where you have no information about their CD4 viral load, chemistry panel, genotype, and HLA status? That's what it boils down to. You're very uncomfortable, somewhat uncomfortable, somewhat comfortable, and very comfortable. Interesting. So somewhat comfortable and somewhat uncomfortable. So there's, there's some sort of tension here, right? Um, people are, are knowing this is, uh, this is being talked about, um, and, uh, but there's still some discomfort. Um, and so that, I think, highlights some of the, the need for the, the logistical concerns that we have to address if you're going to try to move towards rapid treatment. And 20% are very uncomfortable. Um, okay, so why would you want to treat same day? Well, better clinical outcomes because you're not, on, you're, you're not off ART. You're on ART sooner, longer. Um, and so and the more you engage people up front, you show them it's important, you get them on ART, maybe they'll be less lost to follow up. Um, maybe they'll be less anxious because, okay, you don't have to wait months to get ART. I know I'm doing something about this. I just got diagnosed, but at least I'm doing something about it, and they're less anxious. And they may trust you more because they see that you're acting too. And we know treatment as prevention works. On the other hand, um, 
it's very unlikely that even a two-month delay in treating and getting ART in hand is going to make a difference. The, you know, START didn't show a big difference in two months. Temprano didn't show a big difference in two months. The HPTN study didn't. The curves take a while to separate. So two months probably isn't going to make a big difference. You might give them the wrong ART, right? All those labs are still pending. Um, you don't want to miss TB or other OIs that would, that would require a deferral of starting ART. There's less time to address barriers to ART and to adherence. You don't have time to make sure they're eligible for all this stuff. They get their paperwork in, all that. So if they fail to do that, you could be forcing a treatment interruption on them. Um, Loss to follow-up after you start ART means you could put that person at risk for res resistance, but if you never started ART in the first place and they fell off the face of the earth, then you don't have to worry about resistance at least. And there's a lot of logistical complexities. This is the evidence base, summarized in one slide, almost. There are two randomized trials, one conducted in South Africa, one conducted in Haiti, that both um, compressed pre-ART care to one visit, or, or prescribed ART and then went on with the usual pre-ART pre care after they actually had ART in hand. There's one trial that was randomized at the clinic level conducted in Uganda where they basically changed the clinic model, compressed pre-ART care, simplified pre-ART care, and gave people same-day treatment. They had consistent results. There's no doubt about it. They had more and faster viral load suppression. They had same or better retention in care, and they had same or better survival. So that, that's clear. Um, and, and I think the international context, people are saying pre-ART care can be dramatically simplified. There were more people lost to follow-up who started ART, and so if you're on an NNRTI-based regimen especially, that is a concern. There aren't any data past 12 months in these studies. There's very limited resistance data. There's no cost data. There's no patient-reported outcomes or mental health data. So it's not that the evidence base is super strong. Um, in the U.S., there's only been one published study that I'm aware of. It was a non-randomized study conducted at UCSF, which is one of the leaders in this. And they, it was, it was people who were, had acute or recent HIV and, or very low CD4 counts were, were routed to rapid treatment, and people who did not have that were continued in the same standard care. Um, they could provide taxi vouchers to get people there. They had a same-day visit that was three to four hours long, pre-ART care basically in, in three to four hours, um, rapid financial assistance, five-day starter pack, DOT of the first dose, nurse follow-up in a couple days, and then the clinician visit in about a week to two weeks. They wor it worked. They had 37 people, 39 people in the rapid arm, and almost all of them got access to medicines within a couple days. <laughs> Um, and they, they cut the time to viral load suppression down by about 100 days compared to the contemporary non-randomized control. How, whether that matters in the long run is not clear, um, um, but overall there was more viral load suppression and shorter time to viral load suppression. It's one study non-randomized. So this is, this, there's a lot of moving parts here. System redesign, removing barriers, capacity for drop-ins, financial eligibility, same-day ART, uninterrupted access to ART and clinician visits has to be uh, uh, somehow um, made available, and then protocols. So it's not something that's lightly uh, endeavored. So last slide. Um, um, you need to measure linkage and retention for your clinic uh, and provider populations. Expand the denominators to find people in the gaps. Um, there's no magic bullet for improving engagement, just like there's no magic bullet for improving adherence to ART. But there are things that we can do that help um, a lot of patients. Be compassionate and constructively identified and address patient and clinic barriers to consistent care. Use ARTIS. It really is. It should be standard of care, um, and there's training available. Um, make sure you do good post-test counseling. Increase retention by using reminders and personal contact, addressing unmet needs, minimizing clinic barriers. Improve the patient experience. That's one thing that is completely in our control. Build trust. Uh, participate in data to care efforts. Attempt to minimize delays in treatment. So thank you all for your attention. I apologize for going over a little bit, and I guess we're open for questions now. Thanks so much. So please come up to the microphones if you have questions. Let me start off by asking you, Tom, in, in these places like UCSF where there's rapid initiation of care, what are the typical regimens that are started, given that there's no, no resistance data, et cetera? So in the, in the publication um, uh, in JAIDS from this year, uh, I think 90% got an integrase inhibitor-based regimen um, because there's little concern that people would be resistant. Otherwise, a boosted PI would be an appropriate regimen. 
And of course, you would need to avoid a Bakavir because you don't <coughs> have HLA data. <coughs> Excuse me. So TAF FTC would be the, the NRTI combination to go with that. OK. And in, in terms of, uh, you know, you showed us some evidence-based interventions. Um, how would you say, like, the implementation of these uh, uh, systems have, have, have been nationwide, and what could be done to improve that? Yeah. Um, you know, it depends on if you're, if you're a glass half full or half empty kind of person. We know from other literature and in, in other diseases that it takes 20 years for interventions to become part of routine care. Well, ARDIS is now becoming routine care 10 years out. So um, actually, diffusion of innovation in HIV is much accelerated um, compared to other diseases. On the other hand, it, is, it has been 10 years since ARDIS was published, and training is available, but it's really now, I think, only it's at the public level, but I think trying to get clinics to do it in the private sphere or the, uh, is, is just now coming on, online. Um, like adherence to antiretroviral therapy, a lot of interventions are studied but not necessarily clinically relevant, but we learn from them. We can modify, tweak our, our systems um, in response to those. So not everyone uses MEMS caps. Um, they're expensive and they're hard to they're hard to manage, but we know from them that um, uh, the more we can use reminders and pillboxes and things like that, that that's going to help some patients. Great. Question at the microphone. Please introduce yourself, if you could. Good morning. My name is Nada Fadol. I'm from East Carolina University. Uh, a couple of years, so thank you for the wonderful talk, by the way. Uh, a couple thank of you. years ago, we started something similar to the REPC in our clinic uh, through CAPAS funding. So we have patient navigators. Um, con contacting patients intensively for the first six months to try to get them engaged in care. And we did show great results that lasted up to 24 months. Uh, the challenge that we're facing, though, is how to contact these patients because frequently the phone numbers are disconnected or they don't have voicemail set up or they don't pick up through, during work hours, so we have to contact them in the evenings. Yeah. So I'm wondering if there are other clinics or sites that have figured out a way to enhance con patient contact, you know, whether it's using Rhino-wide funding to provide, you know, cell phones to these patients or any creative ideas out there. Yeah, so um, we just had a call. Uh, the Rebecca Dillingham at UVA has uh, developed an app. She and her colleagues, Karen Ingersoll, they developed an app um, that um, is sort of the, you know, I would put it close to the holy grail of, of what we're looking for in terms of apps. Um, they presented their results at the adherence meeting in Miami just this past year. Um, and and it, so it has a lot of functions, including the ability to reach out to the clinic through, um, through a secure messaging portal. Um, and so they can do that anytime. There's also a peer support piece in it, so people can support each other in a way that where they're anonymous. Um, but I, um, and so it sort of tries to maintain that HIPAA com uh, confidentiality. Um, I think mobile applications are probably um, the way to go here. You know, if you're using Epic, there's the in basket, uh, there's the messaging service within Epic. It's clunky because you know you can't do it directly from your email. You got to log into their portal, but it's it's better than nothing. And, but that contact information is critical. Um, it, this is one of the challenges in the data to care approaches. The longer you wait to make sure someone's out of care, six months maybe too soon, maybe they just missed a visit, and so you want to give them to nine months and then call that person out of care. The longer you wait, the colder the trail goes, and every, you know, the phone numbers change and the addresses change, and so it's, it, that, trying to find that sweet spot's hard. But I think social media or, or uh, uh, social uh, media technologies are probably where we need to go with this. Okay, so we have a little under five minutes. We'll try to cram in some quick questions and answers. Uh, so uh, someone asks uh, that they're considering hiring uh, peer HIV-infected patient navigators to help with retention. Are there any data to support that model? I wish I could say there's great data, because I did one of the studies, um, and it was negative. Um, <laughs> but um, there's a, there are uncontrolled uh, data um, and the patients, I have to say, love talking to someone who has been through what they've been through. So um, it, 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 in some ways, um, I can't say don't do it, but I can't say that there's a strong evidence base to say it's going gonna, it's gonna to make a huge difference. Um, but it, you know, anecdotally, and in, it does help, especially the new patient who's coming in for the first time, but just puts them much more at ease. Okay, question at the microphone. 
Yes, I was wondering what your experience was reaching across professions. Um, because we're talking a lot about the, the medical model and the clinic model. One of my experiences has been as a provider, um, for instance, reaching over to case management. Mm -hmm. And so I have adapted case management as one of my referral sources. And so they are listed there with Dr. So-and-so and the endocrinologist, and I send my, my referral over to the case management entity. Well, what I get back from the case management entity entity is you can't do that because we need a release of information from your patient or from the client that they refer to. And I'm a nurse, so I do understand that. I need a release of information from that client to be able to reach out to them. So we're not going to reach out to them until we get a notification from them that it's that okay. It's okay. Yeah. And, and, and then also we're talking about HIPAA. And I Love HIPAA, believe me, I You're the love only one. HIPAA, okay? <laughs> I respect it, I'm health policy, I get it, but we also use it as a mechanism yes. to not do work. Right. And so um, I think that we could do a lot more. For instance, pharmacists. Mm -hmm. They might not be coming for our antivirals, but they're coming for their antibiotics, they're coming from all these others, and I'm very surprised when I find pay, um, colleagues of mine that are not looking at refill records. Right, so let's just try to, yeah. sorry, we're maybe- Yeah, no, the um, comprehensive services as much under one roof as possible so you can get away from having the patient having to travel is something that the evidence supports. Um, you know, um, HIPAA is probably the most invoked and misunderstood law out there. Um, uh, well, that's an overstatement, but um, but it is people do use it as an excuse uh, to avoid uh, doing the hard work. Um, but the more you can offer under one roof, the better. Uh, some places don't have that op uh, as an op uh, as an option, though. I understand that. So there are a bunch of questions related to the rapid initiation of treatments. So let me see if I can try to combine these. Uh, so a question about payment if they're uninsured, and I think the ability to have medications on site if the, 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 the regulations don't allow that? How do you actually uh, implement that? So maybe we'll start with those two. You know, all the, these, are, these problems um, really are local. They need to be solved locally. You know, what, what works in San Francisco is not going to work in Houston. I can guarantee that because getting medicines, um, you know, when, when if if there's a two-week delay in ADAP approvals in Texas, but there's a you know a couple-day processing in California, well, then there, there's other the the need to fill in the gap is a, it's a different gap. Um, so I don't have a magic uh, a single solution to to the how do you get medicines. Um, it's just being creative and talking to talking to your pharmacy and administrators to understand what the options are. We are using, or going to be using again, Harbor Path, which is a, is a nice service. If you're not aware of it, look it up. Um, but even that takes you know, a week or so to get, to get medicines delivered to the patient. And then if there's no clinical impact seen in a two month delay, what's the benefit of a test and treat protocol? answer um, quickly. I know yeah. it's not easy. But. So when I, t I was talking to my mom about this, um, and she said, what? She said, are you kidding? You just, someone just got diagnosed with HIV and you're not treating them on the same day? I mean, it, it just doesn't make sense. And so if my mom has that reaction, what about a patient, right? Um, so I think there's, a, there's probably a good mental health benefit. I think there's a good, there's a good argument to say it improves linkage and, and keeping people in care. But um, but it's hard, it's gonna take a lot, a lot of people to prove that it improves uh, forward transmission um, and survival, right? I mean, that's, those are really too high bars, but I think it probably will improve retention in, in the short run and maybe in the long run. Okay, great, so I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions, but uh, very, uh, I think, uh, controversial and intriguing uh, topic, and uh, thank you for that, and maybe there'll be opportunities for people to interact with you. With Absolutely, point. and there's also the workshop this, this okay, afternoon. Okay, great, so thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so moving on, it's uh, with some trepidation that I introduce the next speaker because he's my boss, but he's uh, been a great uh, friend and colleague over the years. Uh, I think someone well known to everyone in general and also from uh, participation on the panel yesterday. Uh, Trip Gulick is uh, 
chief of the Division of Infectious Diseases at Weill Cornell uh, Medical College in New York, and Rochelle Belfort, professor of medicine, has really been a leader in the area of antiretroviral therapy, really pioneering uh, multiple novel approaches to treating people with HIV, and will be updating us today on investigational drugs for HIV. Thank you, Marshall. Good morning, everybody. Happy to tell you it's only going to be 96 degrees here in San Antonio today. Uh, and it's gonna be 93 in New York. We're gonna talk about investigational drugs for HIV. I have no disclosures. So our learning objectives are to appreciate the latest data for new drugs in existing classes, including nukes, non-nukes, and integrase inhibitors, and then to learn about some of the new mechanisms of action for HIV drugs in development. So as everyone knows, this is the timeline of antiretroviral therapy. One thing to notice is that uh, 2017 is the 30th anniversary of the approval of the first antiretroviral drug, AZT. There's been a total of 29 drugs approved for the treatment of HIV infection. But notice that 2016 was a year where we didn't have a new drug. And then 2015, the drug was TAF, which is really an improved preparation of a drug we already had. And then notice that the year before that, 2014, there were no new drugs approved either. So what's going on with the pipeline? Well, s fasten your seatbelts because this year is gonna be a big year for the approval of new drugs. And these are drugs that you need to know about. So here's a list of some of the drugs that are in the pipeline Right now, they're organized by mechanistic class across, across the top, nukes, non-nukes, PIs, entry inhibitors, integrase inhibitors, and the unfortunately abbreviated maturation inhibitors. <laughs> and then uh, going from phase three down to phase one. So I'm not gonna try to review all of these compounds today. I've chosen these compounds that you see circled here, so six either because they are in advanced stages of development and we need to know about them, or because they offer something different over what we have today. So let's start with the nuke class. How could we improve over the nukes we have today? Well, one way to do it might be more convenience. The ones we have today, as you know, can be as simple as one pill once a day. What could be more convenient than that? So an investigational compound in development is, doesn't have a name yet, MK8591, also known as EFDA, and there's the structure on the right. This is an adenosine analog, and it is a reverse transcriptase inhibitor, but it does it in a different way. So this is a non-obligate chain terminator uh, that inhibits RT by preventing translocation. So just when you thought you knew every abbreviation, you now have to know what an NRTTI is, a nucleoside reverse transcri transcriptase translocation inhibitor. So it prevents the enzyme from sliding down the RNA template. That's how it works. The half-life of this compound is exceedingly long, 150 to 160 hours. That could permit once weekly dosing. So what's better than once a day? Well, maybe once a week. It's potent in the test tube. It has broad activity against HIV 1 and 2 and multi-drug resistant strains. It accumulates in lymph nodes, uh, the vagina, and the rectum in animal studies presented at CROI. And it is potent at very low doses and can be formulated into parenteral formulations. So here's some of the data to back up the statement that it's potent at low doses, this is a phase 1b study, single dose, monotherapies, and one dose at baseline. And what we're looking at here are viral load changes out to 10 days later at various doses. And you can see they go from a half a milligram to 30 milligrams, so really escalating, but still at very low doses. The highest doses at 10 days, you can see the viral load level still going down and quite potent, nearly a two log drop. So this is a potent, long-lasting antiviral agent. It can be parenterally formulated. This is animal data using two different formulations of an injectable form of this compound. And uh, note that we're going out to six months. So a single injection 
in animals at time zero, and you still have levels of the drug that are detectable six months later. So might this provide a, a really unique option for antivirals moving forward? Yes, if we have drugs to pair it with. And then if it's good for treatment, perhaps this would also be a good PrEP drug prevention. So Marty Markowitz, a uh, fellow New Yorker, presented these data at the recent IAS meeting. Um, they used this compound, MK8591, versus a placebo uh, given to male macaques, so this is uh, animal data, weekly, once a week, by oral gavage, up to 14 weeks, and then six days after dosing, they challenged the macaques with intrarectal shiv, and then followed them until they became infected or they had a total of 12 rectal challenges. What you see in the slide here is that all of the placebo monkeys ended up becoming shiv infected and zero of the group that got the new compound, the MK8591 weekly injections, uh, acquired the shiv infection. So this early data seems to support that this compound could have potential for PrEP as well, and human studies are planned. Shifting gears to non-nucleosides, we have a whole bunch of them. What could be better than the ones we have today? Well, I think you'd agree less toxicity, better tolerability, active against non-nuke resistant viruses, and fewer drug interactions would all be positive features of a new non-nuke. The one in development is Deraverine. This is an investigational NNRTI. It's potent at low milligram dose. It's metabolized, as many compounds are, by CYP3A4, but it's neither an inhibitor nor an inducer itself, and therefore has a lower potential for drug-drug interactions. In the test tube, it's active against viral strains with the following mutations, many of which you will recognize, K103N associated with efavirenz resistance, Y181C with nevirapine resistance, E138K associated with etravirine resistance, um, and even combinations of these. So this new compound does have activity against these resistant viral strains. Phase one data with this compound has been published, as has phase two, which compared Deraverine versus Efavirenz, but we now have phase three data to, uh, to review on Deraverine. So here's the first phase three study. There are two. This was presented at the CROI meeting this year. It's called Drive Forward. I have no idea why it's called that, but this was a phase three multi-center double-blind, placebo-controlled, randomized study. It took treatment-naive patients with viral loads of at least 1,000 and no genotypic resistance to study drugs. And you can see it was a big study. Um, over 760 patients were randomized one-to-one. -one. Everyone received two nucleosides, and then they were randomized to either the new compound, Draverine, at a dose of 100 milligrams, versus the control arm was boosted to Runivir at the standard dose. So head-to-head, -head, two nukes with Draverine or the boosted Darunavir regimen. What we're looking at here is less than 50 data through 48 weeks, and you can see that the two arms are overlapping. So uh, 80 to 85% of all patients were suppressed below 50 copies at the end of 48 weeks. Protocol-defined virologic failure was uncommon in either arm, and those that failed, there was no drug resistance in either arm. You can see discontinuations due to adverse events were also low, less than 3% of patients in either arm, and then lipids were slightly better in the Deraverine arm versus the boosted Darunavir arm. So they concluded from this study that Deraverine was non-inferior to boosted Darunavir. What we heard at the IAS meeting was the second phase three study called Drive Ahead. So a very similarly designed study, also over 700 patients, but here it was a head-to-head -head comparison. TDF FTC Deraverine at 100 milligrams, and note that it's co-formulated, so all in one pill, versus the standard co-formulated TDF FTC and Efavirenz. So everyone received two pills, it was placebo-controlled, but it was a two-pill regimen. 
So head-to-head -head versus efavirenz, what we're looking at here again is the less than 50 data out to 48 weeks. And again, you see that the two lines are overlapping um, with, uh, again, around 85% of all patients suppressing below 50 copies. Again, protocol-defined virologic failure was low in either of the two arms. Drug resistance was low. Discontinued to reasons other than virologic failure, which would include toxicity, 10 versus 14 percent. And you can see some of the common side effects that we worry about with efavirenz did occur in the efavirenz arm. For instance, dizziness, 37 percent versus 9 percent with deraverine, or sleep disorders, 12% with deraverine versus 26% with efavirenz. The overall conclusion, once again, in this study was that deraverine was non-inferior to efavirenz. So these two studies have been submitted to the FDA and certainly would seem to support approval of deraverine, so that may be available later this year, and it will be co-formulated TDF, FTC, and deraverine in one pill. Switching gears to integrase inhibitors, what could be better than the ones we have today? Well, one that would be active against integrase-resistant virus, or again, more convenient than once a day. Two candidate compounds, one we heard a bit yesterday, Bictegravir, or you can call it BIC for short. Uh, what we're looking at here is in vitro data against a number of integrase-resistant strains. You can't read this, but this is multiple mutations in integrase. And the four different colors are the four available integrase inhibitors. And do they have activity uh, against these resistant strains? Um, and so if the virus is growing, the bar will be bigger. And you can see that uh, these two, which are raltegravir and elvitegravir, have plenty of uh, resistance or really don't grow. Sorry, say that again. They are not active against these resistant viruses where you get strong inhibition with in green dolutegravir or in yellow bictegravir. And there's a slight suggestion, again, these are laboratory data, that BIC may have increased activity against some of these resistant strains. This compound is long, acting a long half-life, supporting once daily dosing. No PK boosting is required for bictegravir. Uh, this topic came up yesterday. Bictegravir neither inhibits nor induces CYP3A4 or the uh, uh, glucuronidation pathway. So the potential for drug-drug interactions is low with bictegravir. Phase one data were published by Joel Gallant. Phase two, which was head-to-head -head versus dolutegravir, recently published by Paul Sachs. And then we heard at the IAS meeting the phase three studies. So here's the first. This was presented by Joel Gallant in Paris. Big phase three double-blind active controlled study. It was for treatment-naive people with viral loads at least 500, GFRs at least 50 uh, because of the uh, tenofovir used, and HLA B5701 negative because of the abacavir used. You can see, again, large study over 600 patients. They were randomized to either TAF, FTC, and Bictegravir, co-formulated in one pill, or the control arm was abacavir, 3TC, and dolutegravir, again, co-formulated. So everybody took two pills, one placebo and one triple combination. Here are the results at 48 weeks. Um, you may not be able to make out that number, but it's about 95% of all people on the study were suppressed below 50 using the snapshot analysis of the FDA. And you can see very few experienced virologic failure in either arm. So because that overlies zero uh, and the confidence interval was above 10%, they concluded that bictegravir is non-inferior to dolutegravir. And that's the first compound that has achieved that. Um, over on the right in the table are adverse events. If you scan down the list, they're very similar between the two arms. Uh, the one that was statistically different was nausea. You can't read it, but it's the third one down. 10% with BIC and about 23% with the dolutegravir arm. 
So that was one of the phase threes. The other one that was presented, again, identical design, but the comparator difference. So the co-formulated TAF FTC BIC versus this time the comparator was TAF FTC plus dolutegravir as two separate pills. So everybody on this study got three pills. And uh, note that the comparator arm was the most popular choice yesterday for initial therapy. So head to head, again, if you look, uh, you can see comparable virologic success at week 48 with high levels in both arms. And again, falling right along the zeros and with low um, confidence intervals that are tight there, and so this study too shows that Bictegravir was non-inferior to the Dolutegravir triple with TAF. The adverse events here were essentially the same in both arms, including nausea was about 8% in both arms and not different, making you think that the previous study, it might have been due to the abacavir rather than the dolutegravir. And very few people discontinued the study due to adverse events, so single digits in both arms. Again, these two large phase three studies showing non-inferiority to standard regimens should support the approval of bictegravir, and it will only be available as a co-formulation with TAF and FTC. So again, probably, Crystal Ball says, this year would be the approval time for BIC. The other integrase inhibitor that's coming along is one we mentioned uh, yesterday, cabotegravir. This is structurally similar to dolutegravir, has a similar resistance pattern. As you've heard, it's available both in an oral form, which shows potent antiviral activity at the doses you see here, that's published data, but the increased excitement about this compound is the injectable form. So this is the nanotechnology formulation using cabotegravir crystals. Uh, can be injected either subcutaneously or IM, and this compound too has an exceedingly long half-life, allowing for infrequent dosing. So either monthly or bi-monthly, or every other month, is the dosing schedules that are being pursued. As we discussed yesterday, the uh, safety issue is injection site reactions, however they're mostly mild um, and transient with subcutaneous dosing. So here is the LATTE-2 study. Joe Iran presented this both yesterday and in Paris, um, and this was the continuation of a 96-week all-injectable regimen of IM cabotegravir together with IM rilpivirine. It was a randomized open-label phase 2B non-inferiority study, enrolled 300 ART-naive people, put them on the oral form of cabotegravir together with the back of your 3TC for four weeks, and then what you see in the first part of this diagram is nearly everybody suppressed on that triple drug regimen. And then they were randomized to continue either with an every eight-week injectable regimen, every four-week injectable, or continue the oral formulation. And what we're looking at here is out to two years of follow-up with an all-injectable regimen. And you can see, or maybe you can't because it's small, but between 85 and 94% of all patients were suppressed on any of these three. A further look at the every eight-week dosing did show a couple of breakthroughs, and on that basis, they are pursuing Q4 weeks um, in the phase three studies with this all-injectable combination. The injection site reactions were nearly universal. All patients reported them. However, 97% said that they were mild or moderate. They lasted a median of three days, and only two patients out of the whole study discontinued due to injection site reactions, so they are well tolerated. Based on these phase two data, they said that uh, the intramuscular regimen was non-inferior, or really the word would be comparable, to oral, and that it was well tolerated, and this supports moving forward with the phase three studies of an all-injectable regimen. Again, if we're looking at less frequent dosing for treatment, then that also says, wow, what about less frequent dosing for prevention, for PrEP? So we heard the results, uh, Rafi Landovitz from Los Angeles presented these results at the Paris meeting. This is a phase 2A randomized double-blind placebo-controlled study looking at cabotegravir for PrEP. 
They enrolled low-risk HIV-negative participants, the target population um, except for the risk, um, just under 200. This was a young population with a median age of 31. Two-thirds were women, a third men. And then they were randomized, three to one, again, to the oral cabotegravir, so the um, loading dose, if you will, to make sure that there are no significant interactions for four weeks. And then they were given cabotegravir IM at a dose of 800 milligrams every 12 weeks or 600 milligrams every eight weeks or matching placebo injections. Again, this was a phase two safety study. It was not designed to look at efficacy of cabotegravir for prevention. Injection site reactions were more common with cabotegravir. Again, about a third of the, of the participants reported these versus 2% with placebo, and very few discontinued. There were no other differences between cab and placebo in terms of safety and tolerability. They did note that the drug troughs were lower with the every 12-week dosing, and so they concluded that the target dose for prevention should be cab at 600 milligrams every eight weeks, and that that was the optimal dosing schedule. So this supports moving forward with a phase three study, and here it is. It's called HPTN 083, and this will be a head-to-head -head study of oral TDFFTC, so the standard of care, versus injectable cabotegravir. Uh, it's a large study, 4,500 people, targeting high-risk individuals, um, specifically adult men who have sex with men and transgender women. And they define high-risk as you see here. This study is up and running, as mentioned, one pill once a day with TDFFTC versus cabotegravir injections. It is placebo controlled, so everyone receives pills and everyone receives the injections every other month. However, there is no all placebo arm that wouldn't be ethical to do. Um, it is designed as a fully powered non-inferiority efficacy study, and it's currently enrolling in cities near you including New York. Okay, let's shift gears to new mechanisms of action. We're always interested in new mechanisms, particularly for people who have multi-drug resistant HIV. And let's use the old hand method. How many of you are following a patient who is resistant to all 29 drugs that we have today? Raise your hand. Okay, so let's see, 12% of you. Um, <laughs> So that, uh, that's the, about the result I get wherever I ask that question. So it is uncommon to see patients like this, yet those patients need options too. So one of them may be drugs with new mechanisms. So let's look. So entry inhibitors, as you know, entry is a three-step process. HIV binds to the CD4 receptor, then binds to the co-receptor or the chemokine receptor, and then the membranes fuse. So of course, we're, we have drugs that inhibit two of these steps right now. We've got the CCR5 antagonist, Maraviroc. We've got the fusion inhibitor and Fuvertide, or T20, which we don't really use. The step that we've never inhibited yet is the very first one, so CD4 binding. So the good news is there are two investigational compounds coming that target this step. One is a compound called Fostemzivir, and it binds to GP120, preventing it from binding to the CD4 receptor. And the other is a monoclonal antibody called Ibilizumab, and that binds to the second domain of the CD4 receptor, so targeting not the virus, but the host. And both of these are in advanced development, so let's talk about them. Fostemzivir is a prodrug. Once it's swallowed, it's broken down to temzivir, that's the active compound. As mentioned, it inhibits CD4 binding by GP120 by binding specifically to GP120. Early pharmacokinetics suggests that it's a daily dose. And uh, here's the phase one data showed for you here, published now five years ago, so getting old. Uh, up to 1.5 log drop in virus at the highest dose to, doses tested. 
Um, but what was interesting is 12% of the people enrolled in this study had baseline polymorphisms in GP120 that rendered fostemsevir inactive. So this may be a compound that we're going to need to screen prior to using it. Some people will have natural polymorphisms making the compound not work. Uh, drug interactions, we heard uh, recently at the IAS meeting, fostemsevir does not interact with oral contraceptives, nor does it interact with methadone or buprenorphine. So those are positive features. Here's the phase two efficacy study. This is from last year's CROI, but also was published by Melanie Thompson in antiviral therapy. So phase two B randomized controlled partially blinded. It looked at treatment experience patients, but they defined treatment experience as having been on at least one ART for at least a week. Okay, not your typical group that we study. They also did test for baseline susceptibility to fostemsevir using an assay, so that was an entry requirement. 250 people uh, were enrolled. Note the unique background regimen here. Everyone received raltegravir and TDF as the background, and then added fostemsevir at one of four doses, or boosted atazanavir was the comparator. So unconventional regimens here. Um, at week 48, viral load less than 50 was 60 to 80% of the fostemsevir group versus 71% of the atazanavir group. So it looked comparable to atazanavir um, in that uh, study population. And then they reported two-year data, or week 96, and 61% uh, of the fostemsevir group suppressed below 50 or 40 versus 53% in the atazanavir group. And you might say, wow, that's lower than we're used to seeing. Remember, it is a treatment experience population. Apparently, they had high dropout in the study. The FDA awarded this compound breakthrough status because of, it is a new mechanism of action, and that helps facilitate the development, uh, speeding it up, essentially. And the phase three studies were done in heavily treatment experienced patients. Those are fully enrolled. We're waiting to see those results. So maybe this year's CROI. Okay, and then ibilizumab is the HIV entry inhibitor. As mentioned, a monoclonal antibody that binds to the CD4 receptor. Uh, this compound has been around in testing for a long time. Note it goes back to 2004 for the phase one. Phase two studies were presented, including in heavily treatment experienced patients and with an optimized background regimen, what's shown for you here, two different dosing uh, methods. Remember, it's all injectable in either green or pink, but what you see, uh, the dotted lines are less than 50. You can see one of the studies showed about a 40% heavily treatment experienced patients able to regain virologic control with ibilizumab and an optimized background. Now, we do have phase three data on ibilizumab, and this is the new FDA phase three way of doing things. So they've changed what's required for heavily treatment experienced patients. And this study will illustrate it. It's the first one that made it to phase three with the new study design. So this enrolled people who uh, had detectable viral loads, had been on ART for at least six months, and were triple class resistant, but had at least one sensitive drug. And note the sample size, 40 for a phase three study. So the study is, design is that you continue ART, but then add ibilizumab at day seven, and then follow, and then optimize the background one week later. So the phase three for a heavily treatment experienced population is just looking for a short-term activity. And that's what they found. So if you look here, we're looking at day 14, and you can see, uh, or you can't because it's hard to read, uh, less than a 0.5 or greater than a 0.5 log drop or a one log drop, you can see the majority of patients experience that on ibilizumab. And then here's the 24-week results showing that 43% of patients were able to regain virologic control with ibilizumab and an optimized background regimen. So these are considered phase three data and could support the approval of ibilizumab in 2017 as for heavily treatment experienced patients. Okay, last two slides 
Two new mechanisms that you need to know about. One are the maturation inhibitors. So if you remember when HIV buds off, its precursor proteins are in this long strand, and that requires specific cutting for full maturation and infectiousness of the virus. And of course, the enzyme that does that is HIV protease. It makes those cuts uh, for full maturation. We're, of course, used to inhibiting the protease enzyme with the protease inhibitors. But another way to block this step is to actually bind the polyprotein components, and that's how this new class of compounds will work. The maturation inhibitors will bind this polyprotein, prevent the cutting by the protease, and that is a, a new antiretroviral mechanism. Now, several of these have reached clinical development, but they have been abandoned for one reason or another. The first, because polymorphisms in about 50% of people rendered bavirumat, that was the first one in this class, uh, only 50% of people were naturally susceptible to it. And then a more recent one had made it all the way into phase two, but then was abandoned, we heard at the IAS meeting, for GI toxicity. What I've been told is that there are a myriad of protease inhibitors coming soon, and so we can't expect to hear more about this class. And then in the very last slide is a brand new mechanism that you might not have heard of, capsid inhibitor. So remember, capsid is part of the structure of the virus. These inhibitors could work in two ways. So this is the last step when the virus is budding off. Part of that is the formation of the capsid. So a capsid inhibitor could prevent the formation of the capsid, but also, when HIV gets into the cell, right at the beginning of the life cycle, the capsid has to break up to release the strands of RNA and the enzymes. So you, the capsid inhibitors target not only the late stage, so the assembly of the capsid, but also the breakup of the capsid. They work in two different places. So the first ones of these are speeding towards clinical trials as well. I'm gonna stop there, uh, and thank you for your attention. Thanks, Trip, for that great overview. Uh, while we're waiting for the questions, uh, again, please come to the microphones uh, if you can. Uh, so Duravarine, I think you said, was being co-formulated with TDF FTC. And just given that we've shifted away from non-nukes in general for first-line therapy and, get, and the formulation with TDF and not TAV, how do you think it's going to fit into our armamentarium? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Do we really need a TDF, FTC, Duravarine combination pill, given what we have today? It, it's difficult for me to think of who the ideal patient would be for that combination. Um, I showed you that phase three, which suggested that there were fewer CNS side effects with Duravarine than efavirenz. Um, are we really eager to start TDF in anybody today? Um, a lot, a lot of people are shaking your heads no, so I, I'm not sure, I guess, is the answer. Okay, a bunch of questions about uh, cabotegravir. Uh, the f first is, uh, how does body fat affect the pharmacokinetics if somebody is underweight versus perhaps morbidly obese? Apparently it doesn't, so it can be used um, in anyone regardless of the body fat. It's the ideal body weight that's important. Um, body fat can complicate getting the injection to where it needs to go. So it's a little more challenging, obviously, if a person has a lot of body fat to get the needle into the muscle. But, but no pharmacokinetic issues. Okay, a couple of questions related to the long half-life and the, the potential for this tail. Uh, uh, do you think that the likelihood of developing resistance is, is higher with a drug like cabotegravir um, akin to efavirenz and the, the long tail? And um, does this also affect its viability as a PrEP option? Great question. And the an short answer is yes. So we've become uh, aware of the difference in half-life in drugs and the propensity to select for resistant virus. The non-nukes are the classic example, right? The two nukes and a non-nuke regimen, if someone stops it or interrupts it, the nukes wash out quickly, and then the non-nuke hangs around for a while, and that leads to the selection of non-nuke resistance. And we know worldwide that's the most common resistance now seen. 
the long-acting integrase inhibitors even go up a notch there because they're going to hang around a lot longer. So for treatment, if someone misses their cabotegravir injection or let's say stops nucleosides and just keeps there, the cabotegravir level is slowly going to go down over the course of months. In fact, we saw data that after a year of one injection of cabotegravir, something like 15% of patients still have detectable levels. We all know what the problem is when you have a level that's low but detectable in the presence of virus, you select for resistant virus. So the tail, as the question asked, is what we call that, the tail of the level of cabotegravir over time. So this will be a real concern for treatment. It's also a concern for prevention, right? If someone gets that one injection of cabotegravir and then falls out of care and doesn't return, if they are exposed to HIV and they still have low but detectable levels of cabotegravir, might they become infected with a cabotegravir resistant virus? That's possible. Thanks, we'll take a question from the microphone. Please introduce yourself. Hi, my name's Patricia Sharkey, and I'm from uh, uh, Sherman, Texas. I have an HIV clinic there, previously here in San Antonio. Um, mefloquine is a quinoline by its chemical structure, and it lost its approval here in the U.S. because of a vestibulopathy that occurred that was recognized long after it was approved. And um, when I found out that l was also a quinoline, it raised by concern about um, using that, not only its requirement for a pharmacokinetic modulator, but that it was similar in structure to mefloquin. And um, so with the emerging CNS side effects seen with some of the integrase inhibitors, I was concerned whether BIC or CAB were also quinolines. Apparently dolutegravir is not a quinoline, but do you know if either of those fall under the chemical structure of a quinoline? Boy, I don't know the answer to that. I think they are distinct entities that aren't chemically the same as L-vitegravir. Ha having said that, I'm not aware that there's any ototoxicity with L-vitegravir that's been reported. Well, the dizziness is the concern. And when I would ask if you felt uncomfortable on a ladder, many of my dizzy patients that were taking L-vitegravir also complained of that. and so. I've mentioned this to Gilead, but they tell me I'm the only one that's noticing this um, possibility of a vestibulopathy. The, again, I, we just have to be careful, right? It, if you look back at the clinical trials of the integrase inhibitors versus the comparators, which were often a Favarin's or a boosted PI, both groups report dizziness at some level. Um, how many of you are dizzy right now? Raise your hands. <laughs> uh, see? 3% in the room. <laughs> so I, I don't mean to make fun of it, but it, it, although I did, but it's, uh, it's, we have to be careful um, always, and that's why we like to do controlled trials, right? Because then that will select it out. Uh, an even better example is uh, vivid dreams, or my favorite, abnormal dreams. So uh, how many people had a normal dream last night? Raise your hand. Okay. So... Good to have comparator arms. Okay, Trip. several questions about uh, deraverine. Um, one is actually a comment. Seems like maybe the, the fixed dose combination could be useful for pregnant women or women of childbearing capacity. Uh, will it be uh, less costly than other regimens? And if so, might it have a role in uh, resource limited settings? And lastly, is there any uh, potential for its use as, uh, in quote unquote salvage therapy? So pregnancy, no, because deraverine will have no track record in pregnancy. So no, we won't be using it in pregnant women anytime soon. Uh, the second was cost. I have no idea what the pricing will be, so we'll see. And what was the third? Resource limited setting. Uh, kind of the same issue. I guess it depends on how much it costs. Or maybe there was a, yeah, I think that's it. Okay, uh, oh, salvage therapy. Oh, and salvage. Yeah, thanks for asking that. So one of the properties of this compound is that it's active against NNRTI resistant viruses, but it hasn't been tested that way. So we really don't know. Could you use it after failure of an efavirenz or an etravirine um, regimen or real pivirine regimen? We really don't know clinically if it'll work or not. 
Same question about big tegravir in treatment experience patients. Right, no data. Um, big tegravir, as I stressed, has activity against some integrase resistant viruses, like its cousin dolutegravir. There is no clinical data available so far. Okay, uh, turning to ibilizumab uh, the, with the CD4 target, uh, is there, are there any potential clinical consequences in the host of blocking CD4? Yeah, great, great question. So in our field and in infectious diseases, we're used to targeting the pathogens, right, not the host. Um, the first compound we have that did that, that targeted the host was? Maraviroc, right? So it doesn't target the virus, it targets the chemokine receptor. And there was a lot of concern about that. Would that have implications for the immune system? What happens if you block CCR5? Uh, as we know, there are people out there that are naturally without CCR5 and they look immunologically, quote, normal. So it didn't seem to be an issue. This issue about targeting the CD4 receptor and would that have immunologic consequences has been looked at pretty carefully so far. And apparently binding to that second domain of CCR5 is not associated with immune defects. It does not change the CD4 receptor functioning, um, at least what they've looked at so far. Okay, there's a question about uh, uh, monoclonal antibodies and whether the host might develop uh, antibodies to the monoclonal antibodies. So that's, been, that's a valid concern and has been looked at carefully, both for ibilizumab itself and for the whole fleet of monoclonal antibodies that are being tested right now. It is uncommon or rare that anybody develops a, a, an antibody to the monoclonal antibodies that are being tested. So for whatever reason, it just does not occur Okay, there's a question about, uh, is there anything new uh, for, I guess, topical uh, prevention uh, of, of HIV infection in women? So I guess microbicides or other interventions? Uh, microbicides have had a recent checkered history um, being less effective um, over time. Um, my guess is, I'm not an expert in this, and maybe Jeannie Marazzo will comment on this, is that uh, people are tending to steer away now from microbicides towards more systemic therapies. Jeannie, is that right? Oh, she's gonna come tell Coming us. Coming to the microphone. Are you gonna talk about this, Jeannie? No. Okay. Um, I, I think it's a debate. I mean, I think in, in a perfect world, having something long-acting and active at all vulnerable mucosal epithelial sites would be fantastic. Um, but I don't know that that's going to happen anytime soon, and I think there's still a need for an on-demand product because sex is often unplanned and sometimes undesired. Um, particularly, you know, when people are using lubes, um, why not have a lube with an active uh, product? So I think people are still interested. And the tenofovir um, gel efficacy, I think, is not nothing. It's probably pretty good if you use it appropriately based on sub-analyses. So I don't think it's dead yet like the Norwegian parrot. Thank you. Actually, I have a, an announcement to make uh, regarding the evaluation uh, system, the online system. Apparently, if you were doing the evaluations in real time, uh, do not close your browser. There's a little bug in the system. If you do, then it will uh, not save your evaluation. So if you are doing it in real time, just keep your browser open um, so that that does not happen. Uh, Trip, you expressed, I would say, some uh, surprise yesterday on the panel uh, when uh, TAF FTC Big Tegravir was a popular choice in 2018, and in light of the data you showed, uh, can you comment on that further? Sure. My surprise was just that more than half the room picked a compound that's investigational to be first-line therapy. The phase three studies I just showed you look good. I guess the question is, are you ready to go to a compound where we only really have a year of follow-up data? Um, we've been surprised in our field before by late side effects, for example, for new compounds. And so I was a little, I won't say concerned, but I was surprised that everybody was ready to jump onto Bictegravir given that it's only been around for 48 weeks. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Trip, for a great presentation. Thanks for your questions, everyone. 
So uh, pleased to reintroduce uh, Dr. Jeannie Marazzo, who's uh, Chief of Infectious Diseases at the University of Alabama in Birmingham and Professor of Medicine. And is really a, a thought leader, leading investigator in, in two major areas, uh, HIV prevention, PrEP, et cetera, and uh, STDs. And today will be updating us on uh, a problem that we all face in our clinical settings, the resurgence of STDs. Thank you so much, Marshall. It's a pleasure to be here and to talk about my other favorite topic, which is sexually transmitted infections. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm assuming I'm just going to go ahead and press the green button. Did I do something wrong? All right. In the meantime, I'll talk about vaginitis. That's my other area of interest. <laughs> Actually, truly, that is a problem. I never get to talk about vaginal health at these meetings because everybody wants to know about syphilis and gonorrhea. So if you have vaginitis questions, I'm happy to talk about that, too. OK, so back to the future. Um, that sort of is the theme for this talk. Those of us who lived through the pre-HIV era or were young enough to at least see photos of it. Um, remember that uh, the 70s and the pre-AIDS era were quite a party. Uh, lots of exciting STDs, particularly in uh, gay men. It was a big deal. And we are really returning to that era right now. And I'll start off by just saying that outright, because there has been some debate uh, about whether we really are seeing an increase in the incidence of STIs in this population or whether it is an artifact of increased screening. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And I do have to do a shout out to my friends in Alaska. Um, if you haven't seen the Alaska condoms, they are really incredibly cool. Keep calm and put one on. Um, I think it's pretty awesome. Uh, these are my uh, disclosures. Um, and just a reminder, what I would like to convey to you today is just that the epidemiology of important STDs in HIV-infected people is changing, particularly syphilis and gonorrhea. You should know what the recommended indications for are for screening in these, and I would like you to recommend some common clinical syndromes associated with these infections. So we're going to talk about what's new, because in a half an hour, I can't really cover the water. We have more time in the workshop at the end of the day to do that. But I want to talk about the epidemiology epidemiology of STIs and what is really a new era of PrEP and also treatment as prevention. Really, if you believe that uh, undetectable is untransmittable, U equals U, then this is a new era and STIs are having a party um, in this area. Gonorrhea, continued antimicrobial resistance, maybe there's hope for a vaccine. Syphilis, the ongoing saga, um, some new mentions of this in the OI guidelines. I think there is a reappearance of chlamydia proctitis in the form of lymphogranuloma venereum, and there's also a lot of rectal chlamydia, some of which is a little bit hard to eradicate. And then briefly, we'll touch on STI immunizations and HIV care. So let's talk about this issue of whether this is an artifact of screening or whether we really are seeing changes in behavior, particularly in men who have sex with men. And since this is really where the epidemiology is evolving most rapidly, I'm going to start on that. If you haven't seen this nice report by Chen and colleagues from San Francisco published just last year in AIDS Behavior, they actually did a nice assessment of um, reported sexual behaviors in MSM uh, in the San Francisco um, uh, Bay Area. Area. And what they found here was that you can see the lines here, uh, consistent condom uses um, in the big dashed line and pure serosoiding in the, um, the single line down there and then prep use in the other dotted line. And basically there is a discordance or a, a detached sort of trend here. You're seeing an increase in the use of prep, not surprisingly. You're seeing a decrease in, in pure serosoiding and you're seeing a decrease decreased in consistent condom use. So really not very um, uh, surprising, I suppose, but I think a pretty good picture of what we are seeing in many other behavioral surveillance efforts. Um, this is being mirrored now by reports in surveillance databases of increases in these infections that go along with unprotected sex. 
These data haven't been published yet. They were kindly uh, provided to me by Julie Schillinger of the New York City Health Department. Um, and these are pretty sobering. These are reported primary and secondary syphilis case rates by sex in New York City in the last five years. And you can see the case rate per 100,000 on that y-axis in men overall and in females. Females are having a little bit of a resurgence. They're way down at the bottom there. But clearly, the vast majority of these new infections are occurring in men. And this is a pretty profound increase, almost a double increase in the last five years. I should remind you, too, that this is primary and secondary. So this is not a result of screening. This is detection of real, active, clinically evident, recently acquired disease. Remember, primary syphilis is the chancre. Secondary syphilis is the disseminated disease. When you see the rash, condyloma lata, neuro, uh, ocular syphilis can be, is, is a form of secondary. Or not really. It's neuro, but it's a recent acquisition. So these are not screening diagnoses. These are real infections that have been coming up. So about 23% increase um, overall, 22% increase in males, and 100% and increase just because it doubled in the relatively small number of cases in women. These data also haven't been published. These are corresponding data over the same years, also from Julie Schellinger at the, at the Mental Health, at Department of Health in New York City, showing male anorectal chlamydia and gonorrhea cases. Now, some of this could be, and probably most of this is, uh, related to screening and detection of asymptomatic disease, since much of these infections, or many of these infections, are asymptomatic. But you still see a dramatic increase of 50% um, in the years uh, that we're talking about here. So really remarkable uh, increases. You could say, well, that's just New York City. Um, actually, Kyle Bernstein at CDC, who I think I have some slides for coming up, um, as makes a couple of points about this and really supports that this is happening at the national level. So in 2013, an estimated one-third of all gonorrhea cases in the United States occurred in 2% of the U.S. population who were men who have sex with men. I thought that was a really staggering way to put it. So this is a big deal. Most infections are asymptomatic and detected only by screening. The problem with asymptomatic infections is because they serve as a reservoir for ongoing transmission. And this is particularly true at the oropharynx. The challenge is that we have a lot of non-pathogenic, nice serious species in the oropharynx, and that provides genetic material for recombination for the bacteria to develop resistance, which we're going to talk about uh, in a minute. And that's a real challenge. It's tough to eradicate infections in the pharynx for reasons that we don't completely understand. And then rectal infection pretty clearly increases HIV risk. It increases target cells for HIV infection, um, and it's probably not a healthy thing uh, to have if you are there. So. The, this question of association causation and enhanced detection is one that people are bringing up a lot. I think it's pretty clear we have less condom use, more STI transmission and acquisition, and we can debate how much of this is due to PrEP and TASP and U equals U. Really, it doesn't matter ultimately, but we are seeing less condom use. However, as I mentioned, we are seeing more STI screening during PrEP use, especially at the rectum and the pharynx. After many years of trying to get people to screen at these sites, I feel like it's finally uh, taken hold. People are also doing self-screening, as we've talked about um, in this uh, venue before at clinics. And I do think that this can result in enhanced detection and treatment. Very interesting paper just published in uh, Clinical Infectious Diseases uh, just a couple of months ago that looked at this concept of this may not be all bad news. And I won't take you into the details, but I think I've got a picture of it here. And if you're interested, take a look at it. What they did was to model possibilities for how increased STI screening, if you actually jump on the people who are detected, treat them, and try to treat their partners, do partner notification and treatment, actually over time might drive down the rates of STIs in this group. And the idea is if you're screening more frequently in people who are on PrEP, you're detecting more infections, you're treating more infections, and maybe you can ultimately get on top of this, no pun intended. Um, so I personally think this is a very optimistic viewpoint because what it would entail is not only very aggressive screening, but more importantly, penetration into the sexual networks where these transmissions are actually being sustained. And we just are still not very good at partner management. We can't even do expedited partner management at our STD clinic in Birmingham, Alabama, because the health authorities won't let us do it. 
the challenge is, too, even if you're going to do partner management, what are you going to treat partners with when you don't have a viable oral pill, right, for gonorrhea? We are doing expedited partner management. For those of you who don't know what that is, that's when you give your patient medication to give to their sex partners without seeing the partners, or you write a prescription for that patient that non-patient, that other partner, or you call it in to a pharmacy. And that's now fully legal in the majority of states. And you can take a look at that online, and we can talk about that if we have time. The problem is that you can't give an injection to the partner, right, to give to themselves of ceftriaxone, which is what we're treating gonorrhea with. So already we're in a quandary, right? You're relying on pills that we say are not good enough for the patient who has gonorrhea to do expedited partner management of partners. So it's a challenge. This was a really pleasant period of time in some ways. There were Nazis back then, but other than that, um, penicillin cured gonorrhea at that time. Sorry, bad time to make a reference to Nazis, but you know what I'm saying. It was World War II. They were bad people. Um, so here are the most recent data from the CDC um, GISP uh, program, the Gonococcal Isolant Surveillance Project fantastic resource. They have been collecting urethral isolates of gonorrhea from men attending STD clinics in the United States for many years. And I point that out because these are only representative of urethral isolates. And given how many men who have sex with men seek care at formal STD clinics, this is a really good window into that population. This doesn't say anything about the data for women and isolates in women. You can extrapolate from the data from heterosexual men that are obtained at these clinics to what we think is being uh, happening in women, but keep that in mind as we talk through this. This probably overestimates the prevalence of resistance in the general population, but it's very relevant for what we're seeing in men who have sex with men. So starting back um, in, and this is actually stratified in orange men who have sex with men and in the darker brown men who have sex with women. And what you're looking at here are the percentage of urethral gonococcal isolates or gonorrhea isolates with elevated minimum inhibitory concentrations, so a sign of resistance to ceftriaxones, the only treatment that's recommended, intramuscular. And what you see here is we had a bit of a scare in 2009 to 2012 where the percentage was peaking up above 1%. That doesn't sound very much, but when that's the last antibiotic you have and it's an intramuscular injection and you have a population having this much infection, that's a pretty scary prospect. A little bit of a retrieve, everybody sort of took a deep breath in 2013 and 2014 and thought, oh, maybe that was one of those cyclic kind of things that we see with gonorrhea. If you look back over many, many decades with gonorrhea, it does seem to do this sort of population thing where it has uh, periods where it's quite resistant and then it goes down again. Unfortunately, in 2015, we see a little bit of an increase there, and we're back up at about 0.5%. Again, it doesn't sound like much, but when do you get rid of a drug um, in a population? What's your threshold for um, deciding you shouldn't use it? We actually got rid of the quinolone, ciprofloxacin for gonorrhea, when it became apparent that about 4 to 5% of infections in men who have sex with men were resistant to ciprofloxacin. So it is not inconceivable, if this keeps going up, that we could lose that drug, particularly in this population. So it's not a happy time. Um, the other thing is that we are also up a tree with macrolides or azithromycin. So we were talking last night about what you would do in somebody who had a severe cephalosporin allergy and you had no choice but to treat them with something else. Most people would have gone to and still are going to azithromycin in the form of two grams. The problem is, and this is a very nice report just published in PLOSH Medicine a couple of weeks ago, looking at the current picture of this problem and what the next steps are, we're seeing an increase in resistance to azithromycin um, when you look at the data internationally. And you can see um, that um, resistance percent can be as high as 70 percent in some countries. In the United States, it's still about 5 percent. However, New York City just presented data from the presentation that I showed you before, looking at recent data, and their azithromycin resistance may be as high as 20 percent in New York City. So that says we are continuing to increase resistance. Why? The CDC made a rather debatable, I think, recommendation uh, in the last set of the treatment guidelines to treat every case of gonorrhea, remember, with two classes of antibiotics. Some people don't realize this, but the recommendations are if you have gonorrhea, yes, you want to 
give the injection of ceftriaxone, but you're also supposed to co-treat with a gram of azithromycin, regardless of whether you have chlamydial infection or not. And that was really confusing to a lot of people. Um, they say, why were you treating with us when we use, use azithro for chlamydia, and we know that the tests are great for ruling out the NAT's negative for chlamydia? The idea was that using two classes, the macrolide and the cephalosporin, would actually buy us more time. Unfortunately, I think that the opposite is happening, and we've probably driven exposure to the macrolides to gonorrhea even higher, um, and I don't think that's paying off well. And we'll talk about what that means for the patient who has uh, intolerance to cephalosporin, because you really don't have many options here. So this is what the CDC treatment guidelines said in 2015. They have not been updated. It's an injection of 250 milligrams the ceftyoxone plus azithromycin. We used to say you could also treat with doxycycline for co-infection with chlamydia. That was removed because over 20% of gonococcal isolates are now resistant to tetracyclines. So you really can't use tetracyclines for gonorrhea. So that's what the guidelines still say. The challenge is cephalosporin intolerance, cephalosporin allergy. And I should also mention, why are we not using cefixime anymore? Cefixime was the one oral third generation cephalosporin we had. It really is not good at curing pharyngeal infection. And the pharynx is very, very difficult to treat, possibly because you don't get enough antibiotic there, possibly because of other things that we don't understand. So there was a study um, published in CID about two year, year and a half ago, that showed the results of a randomized control trial that compared two regimens. Both contained azithromycin two grams. So right there, you're seeing a problem with this study because we knew at that point that two grams of azithromycin is probably going to treat most gonorrhea, even though I said that resistance is increasing. And they were randomized to receive either concomitant intramuscular injection of gentamicin or an oral quinolone gemafloxacin given uh, one time in a dose of 320 milligrams. And gemafloxacin is another quinolone that has an extended spectrum of, of activity. It's kind of like moxifloxacin. It would work for upper respiratory tract infections. It has some anaerobic therapy, anaerobic activity, and it's got very good gram-negative activity. And the results were quite good. Everybody was cured in the gentamicin group, and only one person failed the treatment in the gemifloxacin group. So they looked good. So this is the recommendation for um, treatment in cephalosporin allergy. What are the challenges with this? Well, number one, um, we can't can't get gemifloxacin. There is, it's not available. There is a generic form. Supposedly, we keep hearing it might be available later this year, but we can't get it. So, if any, has anybody been able to use it? I'm, I'd be surprised and impressed if you had. Okay, um, gentamicin, giving an intramuscular injection. Um, some people say, well, it's not any different than giving ceftriaxone. Challenges is not readily available in many of the clinical settings you're talking about. You do have to go out of your way to get it. Nonetheless, I think this is a viable option and it's one thing you can do. What other things could you do? What about fluoroquinolones? Could you go back and test the isolate for susceptibility to fluoroquinolones? When you look at the GISP data and look at the resistance to, uh, sorry, to ciprofloxacin, the majority of isolates still remain susceptible. And there are some people who argue that we should be able to use a rapid test, which people are just beginning to develop, to look for fluoroquinolone resistance in gonorrhea. And that way, as soon as you know it's gonorrhea, you could check for quinolone resistance and go ahead and use Cipro or some other uh, quinolone uh, to, to go ahead and treat that. I think it's a really intriguing idea. My concern is that quinolones will be overutilized and maybe inappropriately utilized in settings where there may be marginal activity, and that'll just drive up the rate of resistance in these organisms. But these approaches are, are very reasonable, and people really do need to start thinking about this. I was reminded how easy it is to get data published on this. There was a paper in the Journal of Antimicrobial and, Chemo Antimicrobial and Chemotherapy, or JAK, whatever it is, this year, with five people treated with as trianam, which you may remember is the only non-aminoglycoside parenteral for gram negative. So when people couldn't tolerate genomycin, tobramycin, all that stuff, you would go to as trianam because it didn't uh, cause any renal toxicity. And it worked in the five patients. But there was no data on the site of infection, and there was no data on the culture susceptibility of those organisms. So, 
I think anything that's a systemically active gram negative will probably work if it's a class that has an experienced resistance, but you really don't have a lot of options. Um, this is a nice uh, article actually in the New York Times just a couple of weeks ago pointing out that the pharynx is probably a dangerous and silent reservoir for gonorrhea and the reporter actually got a lot of facts right here because it's actually not that obvious. I have actually been asked by people how men, how could men get gonorrhea in their throat? <laughs> I could not make that up. <laughs> Actually, somebody tweeted me about that after this because I was quoted in this article and somebody tweeted, I don't understand how people can get gonorrhea. Like, oh man, go online. Um, so, so managing treatment failures. Managing treatment failures is a little bit like trying to decide what you're gonna do with the cephalosporin allergy, right? Except that I would say most treatment failures are likely due to reinfection, the vast majority, given the challenges with treating partners that I mentioned. If you suspect treatment failure, the best thing you can do is to try to get a culture and susceptibility. How many people have access still to gonorrhea culture, even though we're using nucleic acid amplification tests? I've actually been surprised by how many people can still do it. And even if you can't do it, you can always find somebody to do it for you. Call, call your health department, contact one of us, we can help you out. Um, if you, so it's important to do that, try to treat the partners. If you um, think it's reinfection, you're gonna treat them with the same thing. And then again, if you have treatment failure that you think is due to a resistant organism, you've got that one, those two choices that I mentioned, but really one choice, and report this. Um, you also wanna do a test of cure seven to 14 days after retreatment if you can. You can do that with a nucleic acid amplification test um, a week or later. So in summary, uh, remember that dual therapy is the recommended regimen. We don't recommend azithromycin monotherapy anymore with two grams due to ease and increasing resistance. If you do have to use it, because that's all you have, be sure to do a test of cure, particularly at the pharynx, because rates of eradication at the pharynx with the two grams of azithro are really, really low. I should mention that even though we have uh, been talking about ceftriaxone resistance in the US, we have not yet had a case of treatment failure due to ceftriaxone associated with resistant organisms, but it has been reported in Japan, France, and Sweden, so they are out there. Test of cure, remember you don't need them routinely, but the times that I would do a test of cure and remember a test of cure is to see if the antibiotic worked, so you can do that one to two weeks after treatment. That's different than repeat testing, which we recommend in everybody three months after treatment, three to six months after, to see if they've gotten re-exposed. That's kind of the most enriched population for gonorrhea, so you really, and chlamydia, so you really want to do that. So pharyngeal infection treated with anything other than uh, ceftriaxone and azithro, urogenital infection treated with anything other than ceftriaxone, that should be azithro, or suffixime azithro. You probably can use that as an alternative. It's not a great option, but you can do it. And then persistent uh, signs or symptoms. And if you're wondering when to do this, um, using a nucleic acid amplification test, you want to do it within uh, after seven days. So that's really helpful. Okay, so let's uh, shift to talking about syphilis. And the things I want to make sure you know here are that there are many quote unquote new clinical manifestations, particularly ocular disease, a little bit more about revisiting indications for LP, serologic non response, and then a word about treatment. Um, how many people have seen a case of ocular syphilis in the last year? Yeah, it's unbelievable. So, I mean, I, I think compared to five years ago when this was, you know, we knew it happened, it was part of our workup as you. Um, this is an amazing uh, resurgence of this. And we don't really know why. Are these particularly new neurotropic ocular strains? Is it because of something about the way the epidemiology has changed? Epidemiology have changed? We don't know. Great MMWR reviewing almost 400 cases just last November. Most of these were among men who have sex with men and most of them had HIV. A few were among HIV negative persons and heterosexual men and women. Several resulted in significant sequelae, including blindness, and please remember these should be reported. Uh, really, a, a, it's a syphilitic emergency uh, within 24 hours of the diagnosis to public health. And that's just a, um, the jurisdictions that were reporting these cases, and I think it's important to note that these are occurring throughout the country. Uh, so this is not just uh, a coastal phenomenon. Um, when you look at the demographic character, Characteristics Again, uh, you may, probably can't see those very well, but 70% of these folks were uh, men who have sex with men. 
And then uh, there's just a nice picture down there of the retinitis and the uveitis associated with this infection. And I think what people don't know is that you can see very impressive, devastating retinitis, retinal hemorrhage, really a vasculitic inflammation of the retina. And that's how people go blind. The retina detaches or they have hemorrhage uh, in the retina. And that's why it's so urgent to treat this as soon as possible. Uh, what I think is interesting there, it was when you look at the stage of syphilis that these people presented with, 26 percent had other manifestations of secondary syphilis. Um, Twenty percent were in the early latent phase. Remember, that's acquisition in the last year by serology, but you don't have clinical manifestations. And then 50 percent were late latent or unknown duration. So pretty much across the spectrum. So keep that in mind. Always important to do a great history about vision, um, anything else going on with the eyes, just like you need to do with hearing for auditory syphilis, headache for more chronic manifestations of neurosyphilis. 22% had additional symptoms, um, but the main thing is that most of these people were symptomatic, 326 of the 388. This is why it's so important to ask. A lot of people just think that a little blurry vision here and there is just getting older. I've heard people say that. There's enough problems with getting older. You don't need to explain your ocular syphilis uh, away by the fact that you're getting older. Um, so, And look at the, the presentations. Most were blurry vision, vision loss, eye pain or red eye, a little bit less, and then something on eye exam. Uveitis, about half the cases, retinitis 13%, and retinal detection was present in 11%. About half of these people had a CSF evaluated, and 70% had a reactive um, CSF. So you don't have to have a reactive CSF to have ocular syphilis, but ocular syphilis is neurosyphilis by virtue of how you get it there. That's why you got to treat it aggressively with aqueous penicillin. Um, just a note about um, LP and syphilis and HIV. How many people are routinely doing a spinal tap lumbar puncture in your patients with HIV? Raise your hand. So just a few. This has fallen off quite a lot. I think the arguments in favor are, and thank Hunter Hansfield for this slide, CNS involvement in early syphilis is common, 40%. Uh, and predicted, uh, and it did predict clinical neurosyphilis in the era before penicillin. Benzathine penicillin, we know, does not uh, penetrate the CNS, and we know that syphilis is contained by cell-mediated immunity, which we know is affected, right, with HIV. And if you look at the older studies there, you're more likely to have neuroinvasion with a low CD4 or a high RPR. I think against routine LP is that the frequency of ser serious neurosyphilis is low in both untreated syphilis and early syphilis if you treat with benzathine penicillin, right? Really uncommon. Um, penicillin and the CNS may not be needed to suppress early CNS invasion, and LPs are not fun. Um, it's, it's a lot of time, and it's unpleasant for the patient. So I think that it is probably um, uh, very reasonable to continue to follow the CDC guidelines, which say do a careful neuro exam and a careful history and LP on the basis of that. One question I get asked a lot is whether you really need all three doses of benzathine penicillin in early syphilis in HIV, because some people like to do that. Remember, early syphilis, you only need a single dose. So that's primary, secondary, and early latent. A lot of HIV care providers are nervous about that and say, oh, I think we should treat these patients for three weeks. This was a open label randomized trial with only 64 participants, and I'll say right off the bat that it did not have the power to tell us the answer to this, but it did show that serologic treatment success in this HIV-infected population was slightly higher in those who got weekly therapy for three weeks, so 93 versus 80 percent. It was not statistically significant. I personally would not change my practice on this, plus Benzathine penicillin is in shortage, big time. So I would personally reserve it, use it as appropriate, and then follow for treatment failure, um, as we recommend doing. And that's just the last thing. This we can talk about this afternoon if you want to, this whole question of serologic serofast state, the fact that some people never get their RPRs or VDRLs down to a non-reactive state when you're following them. I would refer you to this p nice paper by Arlene Senya. Um, basically, she showed that whether you were HIV infected or not in this very big meta-analysis or a systematic review, that about one in 10 people never really got down to a non 
non-reactive state. She didn't really see a difference in HIV-infected people's tendency to do that versus not, um, and it wasn't really clear what predicted that. I think the bottom line is that this is probably more common in HIV-infected patients, people who stay at 1 to 8, 1 to 4, 1 to 2, sometimes even as high as 1 to 32. I've heard people even as high as 1 to 124, 256. And what you have to do there is really look at the trajectory of their serologies, talk to the patient, try to decide if it's reinfection, re-exposure, or true treatment failure, and probably for some patients, go ahead and do an LP to rule out CNS uh, reservoir. Complicated story, but we can talk about it a little bit later. So just in summary, impressive research in epidemic of syphilis, um, still very much in HIV, didn't talk about it, but congenital syphilis events are still occurring. Be aware, we had 11 in Alabama in 2016, the big outbreak in California recently, so not trivial. Early syphilis predicts HIV acquisition. It's a great reason to start people on PrEP, and serologic non-response is probably column you, uh, common. You just need to follow that up. So what do we do while we wait for a vaccine? I wanna just show you some very interesting data that is from a study that was done in association with the Epergay study. They were very frustrated, as were many of the PrEP studies, because the incidence of STIs in these studies was about 30%. One in three men in the PrEP studies pretty much got an, H uh, an STI. They actually decided they were gonna do something pretty innovative, which struck horror into the hearts of traditional STI people, but I was really glad to see them shake the field up. What did they do? They randomized men who were in in the Epergay study, which remember is on-demand peri-sex prep, a dose of Truvada or TDF-FTC before and after sex, to either on-demand post-exposure doxycycline. Why doxycycline? Chlamydia, syphilis, incubating syphilis, it's the alternative therapy, and some effect against gonorrhea, not a lot. Or to no PEP. And what did they show? And I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly because I know I'm out of time. Um, in the people who did not get PEP, what was the time to first STI? You can see over the course of the subsequent 10 months, almost 50% of these people got an STI, chlamydia, syphilis, or gonorrhea. In the group who got the post-exposure prophylaxis doxy, that was reduced quite a bit by about 47%. When you looked at the individual STIs, and I should mention this was presented at CROI last year, uh, chlamydia was reduced by 70% in this group, as you would suspect. Syphilis, surprising to me, was reduced by 60% in that group. Lower rates of syphilis, but still impressive. Problem was that there was no effect on gonorrhea, and that's not surprising given how much resistant gonorrhea that we're seeing. So. The conclusions here is that PrEP was, I'm sorry, PAP with Doxy actually did do a pretty nice job of reducing overall incidence, but didn't affect gonorrhea. The key thing is, what was the antibiotic resistance profile of gonorrhea here, and what are you gonna do about it? Clearly, we need new strategies to fix this. Um, is this an answer? Should we start doing it? I can't say I would recommend it, but it's definitely worth thinking about. Um, okay, in two more minutes, I'll just finish up the rest of my slides because it looks like I do have two minutes, although it says I'm out of thing. But let me just tell you very briefly, um, lymphogranuloma venereum, the form of chlamydia trachomatis that can cause severe proctitis. How many people have seen a case in the last year? Do you think it's increasing? Or is it just sort of the same thing you've been seeing? I think it's a question. Um, this was a nice review from CDC uh, sh talking about 38 cases. Just remember to think about this if you see a man, uh, almost never see it in women, with particularly bad proctitis. And remember, you have to treat it for three weeks with doxy. If you can't do specific testing and you just can only can get a gnat for chlamydia uh, trachomatis, you can't tell the difference, unfortunately, with the gnat, um, then just go ahead and treat for three weeks. And ideally, you should call your health department because it would be nice to let them know. The last thing I'll talk about it's just STI immunizations and HIV. Remember, vaccinating for hepatitis A and B should be routine. Um, either nine-valent HPB or four, which is probably not going to be available for much longer, through age 26, and then meningococcal vaccine. So remember that this is now a recommendation. What I think is uh, really fantastic, I won't take you through these, but this is a beautiful review of how we are seeing declines 
based on cervical or pap smear detection in oncogenic HPV strains in the United States. It's really amazing. Australia, because they have uh, required school-based immunization because they're an enlightened country, except when it comes to gay marriage, um, they have eliminated genital warts from their population. So we are really going to see this. The other fascinating thing I wanted to tell you about is this great paper in Lancet ID that showed that as meningococcal vaccination ramped up in New Zealand, I love these small countries that are like a little, little kind of natural experiments, um, they had a marked decline against gonorrhea, in gonorrhea. So it suggested that there was actually cross protection. People got very excited about this, a lot of debate about this. I don't have time to go into the methodology, but I think it's real. And it offers hope that maybe someday we could really kind of design a vaccine for gonorrhea or maybe that this vaccine will have an effect. Last thing I'll just mention, STD screening for men who have sex with men. Um, obviously, HIV, syphilis, urethral gonorrhea, chlamydia, rectal gonorrhea and chlamydia if they report exposure, and pharyngeal gonorrhea if they report exposure. We don't recommend routine screening for chlamydia at the throat. Uh, doesn't appear to be pathogenic. And then remember, hepatitis C can be an incident sexually transmitted infection, and we can see that. Um, this is our self-testing program at the University of Washington. For those of you who are interested, I can get you these posters. It's been a very successful approach, and many of you are doing it now. Um, and just a reminder, we don't recommend routine screening for herpes, HSV2 infection. I'm going to stop there and remind you just to screen appropriately. Beware of antibiotic-resistant gonorrhea. Syphilis is not going away hepatitis C, and sexual health. And thank you. OK, great. Thank you so much. That was really excellent. Uh, we have a lot of questions. And some of them, actually, you answered in your last few slides. So let me just sort through these. Um, first question relates to STIs during pregnancy. Could mm -hmm. you comment on tests of cure for syphilis, GC, chlamydia, the, the timing of those testing? Yeah, great. So um, test of cure, so just a reminder, everybody should be screened in the first trimester of pregnancy for common STIs. That includes syphilis, chlamydia, gonorrhea, and trichomoniasis, uh, very much so. Um, and then if they're at increased risk, which is defined pretty broadly, you should screen again at the third trimester, because what you don't want to miss is a third trimester um, new, for in particular, gonorrhea or chlamydial infection. Um, test of cure in those settings can be done just the way that you would do it in other Settings. So I would say if you're using a nucleic acid amplification test, uh, like the Genprobe Aptima, for example, which is what most people are using, you can do that anytime after seven days. And that's what I'd recommend. And remember, um, the preferred um, diagnostic test or diagnostic specimen in women is a self-collected vaginal swab. You do not need to get a cervical swab. Uh, actually, the vaginal swab is a little more sensitive. And you can always get a urine. It's slightly less sensitive, but it's still good. OK, a couple of questions about uh, treatment of GC. Can you comment on I am erdipenem? And then uh, there's a comment that in Southeast Asia, they're escalating the ceftriaxone dose mm -hmm. to 500 milligrams or even a gram in combination with azithromycin. Are we headed mm -hmm. there with that increased resistance? Yeah, great, great questions. Um, Erdipenem, I am not aware of any data. If people have used it and have experience with it, I'd be interested to hear about that. Um, should it work? Sure. Um, I think it should work. It would be an expensive uh, option compared to what we have available. But I think we are going down a road where anything with good gram-negative parenteral systemic exposure is going to be uh, probably fair game. So you know, if you happen to be using erdipenem for something else, why not? Um, the other question, escalating the dose of ceftriaxone. Yes, so there's paper in JAMA a couple years ago from the UK. They actually increased their recommended dose of ceftriaxone to 500 milligrams I think around 2012 or so, maybe 2014, it would have had to be a little longer. And the JAMA paper actually showed that in subsequent to the increase of the dose, they saw a decline in gonorrhea incidence and maybe a change in susceptibility. So they were making the argument that this was the right thing to do. This was debated at the 2015 CDC STD treatment guidelines, and people felt we weren't ready to go there yet. Japan has now is now using a gram, that largely because they've seen active treatment failures. So I suspect it will be something under discussion at the next revision of the treatment guidelines, um, but it has not happened yet. Should you use it routinely? Not yet, unless we start to see increases in the antimicrobial resistance or we start to see treatment failures. Don't 
Tony, did you want to comment? Were you the Erda Penham man? Okay. Go ahead, please. Uh, Jeannie, thank you for such a great talk. It's always great to, to hear you, and you make it all seem so clear and everything. Uh, you, you very much outline, you know, the indications that the CDC put uh, about uh, three-site testing in men who had sex with men. Um, but somehow it seems that their uh, recommendation doesn't get transmitted over to other federal agencies that, that yeah. pay for treatment. Yes. Um, so uh, I was just wondering if there's any way that we could actually, you know, either ISUSA as a group or HRSA or someone could could sort of step forward and encourage uh, Medicare and some of the other federal payers to, uh, to cover that? Great, great point. Great question. Um, let's talk a little bit about, more about that. Gail Bolin at CDC, who is the head of the STD branch, and Kim Workowski, who, who leads the CDC treatment guidelines, they're really interested in this and really active and would be, I'm sure, uh, I don't know, Laura, if, we, if you've talked with them about this, I'm sure you have, but I think it's a really, really critical thing, and people are interested. It would good, be great to get Gail here, actually, at some point to talk about some of these efforts, maybe next year if we can, or before to hear about this. So thank you for bringing that up. You know, it's so funny. When you actually read, or, or when you talk to Medicare, what they say is they all go by the preventative services guidelines. And yeah. then if you actually go and read the preventative services guidelines, um, it's all about women. The preventive services guidelines are no help to STDs. <laughs> I'm sorry. They're really, in fact, if anything, they have taken a pathologic approach to what I think should be an evolving framework of sexual health. And so what they demand is level four randomized clinical trial data for things that are focused on presenting, pre preventing uncommon pelvic pathology in women. Now, I'm as much for or against preventing pe pelvic pathology in women as anybody is, but, but I think it's just not the right um, sort of patient-centered approach because it doesn't speak to the individual patient, it doesn't speak to the dialogue with that patient, and it doesn't speak to the other benefits, which are in, a lot of which are intangible, um, of, of testing. So, I mean, yeah, so, thank you. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Thanks for the questions. Uh, should we be screening for mycoplasma genitalia, oh. particularly in large, Great oh, question. exciting question, in large cities yeah. where there is an international population, is yeah. it true that up to 10% of strains are resistant to all yeah. antibiotics? Great question. I apologize for not having time to talk about M. genitalium. Um, big discussion, just a nice JID, Journal Infectious Disease Supplement on M. genitalium just came out uh, last month based on an NIH workshop we had on this. So for those of you who don't know, mycoplasma genitalium, sort of kind of related to mycoplasma Plasma uh, pneumonia, which causes pneumonia, but not really that close. Um, probably responsible for maybe about 10 to 15 percent of non gonococcal, non chlamydial urethritis in the United States. Um, so it is clearly a pathogen in the urethra. Um, it does not respond to um, doxycycline. It is getting more resistant to azithromycin. So the recommendation, remember, if you have persistent urethritis that's failed treatment to doxy and azithro, um, and you don't have someone who has trichomonas, right, which can also cause urethritis in heterosexual men, um, so you could treat with two grams of metronidazole, is to go to moxifloxacin. And moxy, um, in, to give you know a week to 10 days, depending on how how aggressive you want to be. Uh, Moxie is good for most of these remaining infections. We have had patients who have failed all three, and we've had to get investigational pristinomycin uh, from France actually delivered uh, to our clinic to treat these patients. So I would keep it in mind. There is a nucleic acid amplification test for it, um, the Aptima. Uh, you can do M. genitalian on that, and I would reserve using that test for treatment failures where you want to diagnose the potential cause. No data to support routine screening yet. Why would you do screening? To prevent sequelae. And we don't have enough robust data to say that intervening with screening and prevention is going to prevent those sequelae yet. But really good question. Okay, Jeannie, some other treatment questions. Uh, doxycycline versus azithromycin for rectal chlamydia yeah. and then sort of preferred PID regimen. Yeah, great question on the rectal chlamydia. So some anecdotal data, some systemic, systematic review data would say that single dose azithro is not as effective for eliminating rectal chlamydia. And we're talking about garden variety uh, chlamydia, not LGV strains right now, um, as a week of doxycycline. And I, I first heard this from providers who asked me about this several years ago. And they were like, you know, I don't even use single dose azithro anymore for my patients whose rectal uh, chlamydia gnats come back positive whether they were asymptomatic or not. 
Um, I think it's probably true. Um, I do think that Doxy is the preferred agent. The challenge, of course, is that you're giving somebody a week. Um, Julie Dombrowski in Seattle has proposed a randomized control trial to look at this. So we don't have great evidence to say. Um, if you think the patient is willing and will take it, I lean towards Doxy, but there's not a lot of an evidence base to really support that. Um, so I think, I think it's an interesting question and we need more data. Preferred regimens for PID, um, so it's still ceftriaxone, uh, doxycycline, right, and then adding metronidazole if a woman has evidence of either severe infection that might be involving anaerobes or bacterial vaginosis, which is an anaerobic dysbiosis. Just two weeks ago, Harold Weisenfeld uh, in Pittsburgh presented data at um, the ID Society of OBGYN, a very big randomized trial where he enrolled women in Pittsburgh, randomized them to the basic regimen, ceftriaxone and doxy, or that regimen plus metronidazole in, in presumptively, so immediately. And the women with the metronidazole group actually did better microbiologically and clinically, saying that probably adding anaerobic treatment to routine PID, clinical PID, is, um, is advised. So no guidelines have changed yet, but, and I can tell you about the study, really interesting. They got endometrial biopsies, all kinds of really interesting stuff. Um, but I think that for PID, um, you know, it's a big, lots of uh, synergistic microbiology, and probably adding that metronidazole is helpful. All right, we're almost out of time, but there's so many great questions. I'm going to take the liberty of going a few minutes over. I think it's not quite 1130. Um, can you use ceftriaxone in someone with a penicillin allergy? Yeah, I think it's very, I mean, if you look at the data on penicillin and ceftriaxone crossover, um, it's it, when you're talking about serious IgE-mediated mediated reactions, it's really very uncommon, less than 1%. I think you can do it cautiously. You should be in a place where there is um, access to um, supplies should you have a serious reaction. Um, but yes, I think that you can do it um, with caution. Okay, I like this one. It seems STI therapies are the red-headed stepchild of our field. Another Me Too integrase inhibitor, no offense to trip, is nice, but is anyone looking for a syphilis therapy, oral or parenteral, that has good CSF penetration? I love this person. They should come work with me. Um, uh, you know, syphilis, what are, what are we using to treat syphilis? Penicillin. What did we use in 1945 to treat syphilis? Penicillin. So, I mean, there have been a couple of challenges with it. It's not an, I mean, you have to grow it in rabbit testicles. I mean, that's kind of a challenge to really uh, study it. We don't have an easy uh, system to cultivate it. So it's very hard to study. Um, yeah, I think if, you know, there's, nobody can tell me that if we put the resources that we have put towards HIV in all, all respect to HIV, clearly it's epidemic of our lifetime. But nobody can tell me if we didn't put at least half those resources to STDs, we couldn't have solved some of these problems sooner. Um, again, it's that, that sort of thing about sexual health and, and pathology, which is always you know, a, a, an issue. So um, people are working on things, but progress has been slow, largely due to low resources. That said, the antimicrobial resistance story in gonorrhea is, is a big hook and has gotten a lot of attention. Um, and actually, when we had a president who cared about these things, uh, gonorrhea ended up on the top 10 list. I think, of, of antimicrobially resistant pathogens. Um, so that was pretty amazing to have an STD on that list. It still is, I think. I don't think that list has disbanded. Okay, so I apologize again for not getting to everyone's questions. I'm going to take one, give you one final question here from the audience. Uh, with new data showing an HPV strain that is more common in African American women, uh, 32 that is not in the vaccine, any data on the impact of this on cervical cancer prevention in African Americans? Great question. I don't know the answer to that. And 32 is not in the nonovalent. Is it not in the nonovalent, the nine-valent vaccine? I don't know the answer. I don't have the nine valent vaccine uh, types in my head. If it is, I wouldn't worry about it because um, because we're going to be using only the nine valent vaccine. Um, that said, if it's not, and this is a real concerning finding, it would be probably not beyond the company's wherewithal to add that uh, to the vaccine because it, it's a pretty uh, straightforward thing to do. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, Sheeni. Thank so you, there is a session this afternoon, workshop on STDs. And uh, I believe there's some affinity groups meeting now. We're going to break for lunch and reconvene promptly at 1 p.m. So thanks, everyone, for a great morning.